and today i'm bringing you the day 35 news of the past 24 hours inside of ukraine today we have a small amount of international news but only one bit so it's not too important most of the news has come from inside of the country today as we've had several more interesting developments over the past 24 hours to go over tonight's schedule we will of course be covering the northern front first we will then be moving from the northern front to the eastern front but in between we will be taking around three to five questions it seems that a lot of people liked there's shorter question segments. And so everyone who's here for the news, just bear with me because I know y'all don't like it. And I see sometimes uh, like our viewership dips because I'll just leave until the questions are over. But bear with me, I promise you. So we're trying to pick out some good questions tonight. And so hopefully y'all hear some new stuff. Uh, we'll then cover the location unknowns and the Eastern Front as a whole. Uh, we will then move on down towards the Southern Front and we'll answer three to five questions in between. We'll then cover the news in the Southern Front and then that will wrap up the news for the day, and then we'll go to nothing but questions after all the news has been covered. I would like to take a special note to say that the Russians appear, at least as far as I know, to actually just be losing at this point. I mean, like, you know, I've, I've been saying that for kind of a few days, but I have to say that now with almost definitive certainty that it looks like they're not really going to be able to recover from the losses that they've suffered now, and it looks like the war has turned in Ukraine's favor uh, but we'll go into detail a little bit more as we just cover the news here. So without further ado, let's get to the news. First off, inside of the city of Irpin, uh, there has been a decent amount of damage today. And if you may recall, there is actually a pocket. And I'll represent that with a line, actually, so that way uh, we can have that more clearly defined. There is a pocket of Russian troops in the Bucha Hostomel Irpin area right here that I'm kind of drawing up right now on the map. Uh, we'll call this the Russian pocket. Hang on, Russian pocket. There we go, we'll color it up a little, make it look nice. Uh, we'll make it somewhat transparent with a kind of like thick border. There we go. So there's kind of a pocket right here in the specific area of Russian soldiers that are stuck and got encircled by the Ukrainians. And so the Ukrainians are starting to put more and more pressure on them and slowly wipe them out. And when you see today that in the process of this fighting, there's been a decent amount of damage in the city of Erpin itself. I'm going to let you all see this video. The damage speaks for itself. And then you see just panning around showing the damage inside of the city. And now I'm I'm gonna I'm we're going to move on past that scene because the last scene was pretty graphic, but I feel sorry for everything that's going on inside of that city right now. I really feel sorry for what's going on around all of Ukraine right now. Because as you saw, there was a um, a dead man in the last scene. I'm not gonna rewind it because I don't want to show that too much. I don't know if YouTube will try and get me for that but there was a dead man on the street and stray dogs running around you know those dogs had owners at a point and that guy may have been one of those dogs owners and now he's dead and the dogs are um, pretty much abandoned to die as well and it's a terrible situation to see people who just li were living their daily lives peacefully probably having a great time um, just dead you know in a split second just because Russia invaded the country unlawfully and then started targeting civilian areas and civilization itself. It's a terrible crime, and I hate to see that this is something that continues to occur inside of Ukraine, but hopefully an agreement can be made soon. It looks like it may actually happen within the next few weeks where the Ukrainians will be able to get a agreeable peace agreement and get out of this war with their country intact. And so we're now going to watch the rest of the video.
as you can see here, just more damage, more civilians killed. And the situation is so rough that they're not even able to collect the bodies and bury them properly like we've seen in other places. I hate this. It's terrible. So that's the end of the video. I'm going to cut it a little bit short, but I hate to see this kind of stuff. It's terrible. It's incredibly unfortunate. I don't like it at all. And hopefully the Russian, ar the Russian army, and you know, a lot of people like to say that the frustration for this war should be directly targeted at the Russian government. At the end of the day, and I know that soldiers only follow orders. That's the thing that everyone always says. At the end of the day, the Russian army is accountable for what's happening inside of the country. They're saying right now that Putin may not even know what's going on inside of Ukraine. Um, so, that being said, that it's really up to the army what they're doing and how they're executing um, their goals. And we can see that they're attacking civilians indiscriminately. Now, I don't believe I don't believe for a second that Putin doesn't know what's going on. It, based off of his speeches prior, we do know that he knows good and well what's going on. Um, so I'm just going to leave that at that. Hopefully this pocket gets crushed very soon and a lot of Russians are captured or units are wiped out in the process. So hopefully this war will probably come to a closer, uh, a faster close in more appropriate terms than it would have anyways. We're now going to move on into the city of Kiev itself, where it appears that a small exchange happened at a checkpoint inside of the city. We do know that Russian forces are not in the city, so this isn't a firefight in between the Ukrainian guards at these checkpoints and the Russians, because the Russians have not made it back to the city as of yet, and they may not ever make it back to the city, considering that their situation has changed drastically. But here's the video. So you can hear the firefight occurring in the distance. It doesn't really sound like a firefight. It actually just sounds like one AK kind of firing quickly on semi-auto. So someone's just pulling the trigger over and over um, kind of quickly. But it doesn't really sound like a full-on just like onslaught going on at this checkpoint. So that's the end of the exchange at the checkpoint. We don't know the exact details or the story as to why this um, kind of firefight took place inside of the city at one of the checkpoints. We just know that it's happened, and as the days go on, hopefully we'll get more information as to what actually happened there if they were trying to uh, stop saboteurs or spies that were trying to blow through checkpoints in the city, or was it um, some kind of unruly citizen who was just taking it upon themselves to... Uh, pretty much violate martial law, which, you know, of course, will uh, elicit a strong response. And while, you know, some people in the comments are about to start saying, hey, wait a minute, that's not right for the Ukrainians to shoot um, civilians inside of the city if they're violating checkpoints. you got to remember this. The country is in a war right now. I'm trying to figure out the best way to word this. The country is in a war right now. And so there are emergency laws in place to make sure that they can try and win the war behind the lines in a way and so if citizen uh, citizens are outright disregarding these laws and making themselves look suspect or a danger to the public they have to take care of these people that's kind of the same as someone blowing through the gates at the white house in a car they will be shot um and it's a lot like um a, a person just driving through a military checkpoint on a base usually um military police are called and they can be shot as well and so you know there's emergency situations where things like that do have to happen and while it's unfortunate if they are uh, citizens that were killed they shouldn't be violating the martial the rules of the martial law at the moment considering that they've been in this war for about a month and so they should kind of get the picture of what martial law is and how it works and to know that this is in the benefit of their country right now considering it is a very dire and emergency situation 
So that being said, we're now going to move on to the Cherniheave area, where we've of course heard no action today as per usual, except for outside of the city, and it appears that the Ukrainians have actually pushed out of the city of Chernihiv and have recaptured a village somewhere in the area. I'm not exactly sure, so this marker isn't accurate, but we do know that as they were recapturing the village, there was a burning T-72B3 in the middle of it, which of course suggests that the Ukrainians destroyed this tank. So I'm going to show you all the video. And so you can see there, the Russian tank was burning, the Ukrainians have recaptured this village in the Chernihiv Oblast. I'm not exactly sure, once again, where this was specifically, but we do have a pretty good idea that the Ukrainians just floored the Russians and retook the village. And it looks like they didn't really take any losses or anything as far as we can tell in the video, but then again, it's a very small area that's being filmed, so we're not entirely sure as to how this battle unfolded and how... Um, the casualties piled up on both sides in the effort to retake this village. All we know is that the Ukrainians retook it, and it appears that they've destroyed Russian armor in the process. Good stuff to see. It's good to know that now the Ukrainians are pushing them back across all fronts, including the Chernihiv area, which was kind of static for the longest time. But now that's also changing as well. And this all, another thing I'd like to touch on a little, although I didn't put it down as a news article today, is that the Department of Defense said in the United States that the Russian withdrawal of forces was small. They said something like less than 20% of them have been moved out of the country, or as they called it, repositioned. But the thing is, is that when you're talking about a withdrawal, and one in every five soldiers has now left the front, that's not half, and that's not a whole quarter. That's still a lot of troops, though. That's one in every five. You know, and while that's not a massive reduction, you know, that's not going towards disarmament pretty much in the northern front, that is still a large amount of troops that they've pulled out. Um, you know, and so I don't understand why they're saying that it's actually a small number, because if you had five guys in a group and you told one of them to leave, while that's not the whole group or most of it, that's still a sizable amount of a group of five people, you know? And so that's what I'm trying to say is that um, I think there's a little bit of a political nuance to what they're saying there and they're trying to pressure the russians i guess to start withdrawing more troops or make it seem like the russians aren't doing a lot in terms of withdrawing but to have 20 percent of your frontline troops withdrawn from the area is somewhat of a big development and if they continue to do that the fighting force could be down to half of what it is if they withdrew another 20 percent of their forces in the coming weeks in the area uh, that also, once again, to touch on that a little bit more, I think that also ties into the logistical issues we've seen in the Northern Front and across most of the country for that matter, but most specifically in the Northern Front, as that 40-mile convoy about two weeks ago stalled on the road and was stuck there, and the Department of Defense and a whole bunch of people on the news and YouTube said, oh, they're not stuck, they didn't run out of supplies, they're thinking. They just drove them into enemy territory in a very dangerous situation where they have to spend a whole bunch of resources trying to protect this convoy and stop it from being destroyed just to think. And I said that didn't make any sense. They probably run out of supplies and things have completely fallen apart with that convoy and they're trying to figure out what to do with it now. And that turned out to be exactly the case as the rearward 17 miles of it returned back to Belarus and the forward 20 miles of it dispersed into the tree lines and did nothing. I mean, like, we heard no news after that about the 40, the remainder of the 40 mile long convoy actually doing anything meaningful in the northern front. They just went to the tree lines and they sat there. And so it tells me that the, the whole entire situation in the northern front has been falling apart since the first week. And so now they're stuck here, no supplies, the offensives have stalled, they're now being pushed back in the counterattacks, and so nothing is going in their direction, and now they've withdrawn 20% of their forces, and now we're trying to downplay, well, the U.S. government, in a way, is now trying to downplay that as well, but from the information we're seeing, we're seeing a clear and obvious trend that the Russians are losing their grip on the northern front. It's only a matter of time before it completely collapses, and the 20% of them being removed is their stopgap effort of trying to relieve their supply lines a little and, and leave less troops to actually have to support in the northern front and hopefully 
they're thinking that these troops can still pick up the slack of the 20% that are now gone. That's kind of how I'm looking at the Northern Front right now. But let me know in the chat if y'all think different, because uh, that's my stance. But then again, you know, this is based off of the information I've been collecting, but maybe y'all have a little bit of different information that may suggest to y'all otherwise. So let me know, uh, because I would like to hear about it if that is the case. But nonetheless, we've actually covered all the news in the Northern Front, and so now we're going to move on to the Eastern Front. But before we do, we're going to take about uh, three to five questions from the chat. And so without, um, without going on further, and that being said, what do we got, Matthew? Okay, so good afternoon, chat. It's good to be back with you once again for another night of questions. So first up, we have a $100 donation from Yachtmaster. Thank you very much for your support. That's very, very generous, we, and we do very much appreciate it. Next up, we have a $50 donation from the Collier uh, Report. He says, uh, down with Putin and Slava Ukraine. Slava Ukraina. And thank you all so much for the support. It means a lot to me, and it lets me know that the channel will keep running. And so huge support like that lets me know that I'll be able to keep on doing these streams for a long, long time and making sure that everyone can keep up to date on the news in Ukraine and I don't have to go and do anything like go uh, get a job or anything like that, although this is a job. so. Um, but thank you very much for the support. I'm very appreciative of everything, and I also have to agree with you. Slava Ukraina and down with Putin. And so we're going to move on to the next question. And next up, we have a question from S. Moore, who puts in a donation of $20. They say, Sam, the slippery sockeye salmon swam by today. He asked, why does General McCaffrey think the M1 tank is the best fit for this fight with Russia? Sam says, don't trust Putin. I don't know the exact reason why the, that general in particular is saying that the M1 is a perfect match against the Russians. But the truth is, is that he's not really wrong from what we can tell. Let me, let me introduce uh, some of y'all who may not know about this battle, uh, the Battle of 73 Easting. This was a battle that occurred in between U.S. forces and Iraqi forces during the Gulf War. Um, the American, let me make sure I get the numbers exactly right. The Americans had 200, 300 armored vehicles. The uh, Iraqis had 300, 400 armored vehicles. And at the end of the day, the Americans only lost one M3 Bradley. Okay, that's one Bradley, which is, um, I would say, it's not comparable to a BMP. But armor-wise, armor thickness and all that stuff, it's very similar to BMP in a way. But don't 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 take that the way some of y'all may take that. That's not that's not what I'm trying to say. But that was all that was killed. No main battle tanks on the American side were killed. Meanwhile, on the Iraqi side, 160 tanks were destroyed. A 180 armored personnel carriers were destroyed. 12 artillery pieces were wiped out, and 80 wheeled vehicles were taken out as well, along with some anti-aircraft systems. All this stuff was Russian equipment that the Iraqis had gotten. As you can see here, here's a T-62 that was knocked out. Um, moving on a little bit further, here's the Bradley that got um, hit, the only vehicle that got destroyed in the whole entire battle. Let me try and find y'all some more pictures here of these vehicles. We're going to just look at pictures of 73 Easting. Also, there were some Chinese tanks involved. There was, like, uh, some Type 69s, which were really just like a Chinese made T-55, but let me see if I can get a specific picture to show you all the variety of vehicles. There's a T-72 right there. That's pretty comparable. A T-72A is pretty comparable to a T-72B, but then when you get to the B-3, it's kind of a little different because the ERA armor on it, like the Contact 5 and stuff, is actually pretty resilient compared to what the original T-72A had. But nonetheless... You can see that the Americans had no problem just sweeping through the Iraqis. Now, they, of course, they were incredibly poorly trained, uh, so that also weighs into the matter uh, as well. But the main important thing that I'd like to like to note from this battle is that American forces had no problem at all going up against Soviet armor then, although the armor was a little dated at that time. But still, we destroyed the base model of tanks that the Soviets field, like a T-72. Uh, they don't field T-62s anymore, which made up a somewhat sizable force of the tanks that the Iraqis used at 73 Easting. But nonetheless, the American tanks floored them. And I have no doubt that in a modern war, an M1A2, which is, I think, better than what we were actually using there. I think we only had M1A1s, but let me check that out again, um, just to make sure. Tanks... 
let's see if we can just get an actual list of the tanks all right let me go through here and check this out real quick we're going third armor division man i think those i don't think the m1a2 had really been pushed into service yet i think the m1a2 came around uh after the gulf war a little bit so i'm i'm assuming that they were probably m1a1s or uh, M1A1HCs or an IPM1, probably not a lot of IPM1s, but um, still, we've improved our armor, the Russians have improved theirs, but at the end of the day, it's still pretty much the same match, because the upgrades are comparable to each other, we know that the Russians don't actually field a large amount of upgraded tanks, most of their stuff is still T-72Bs and T-72As and T-80Bs and T-80Us and such, and so they don't have a lot of that modern upgraded stuff, while the United States fields nothing but M1A2s at this point, and the Marine Corps has gotten rid of their tanks altogether. So we know that the Americans, technology and armor-wise, would be able to destroy Russian armor in a in a head to head in a head to head fight in a way. So I hope I answered that question really well. Thank you very much for the support, and we're going to move on to the next question. And the next question is from Colin Martin. He puts in a uh, donation of twenty dollars and says, "What's your take on how the civilians of Mariupol?" perceived the Azov Battalion between 2014 and 2022, and how and if that's changed since the invasion. So I can't really speak for the Ukrainians per se. Uh, I did. I have spoken to a decent amount of Ukrainians, and it appears to me that most of them support the Azov Battalion from the ones I've talked to. Uh, so as far as that goes, although that's a small sample size, I've only talked to about five Ukrainians. Um, but still, all of them have shown that they really don't care that a lot of people in the West think that it's some sort of far right wing military group. The Azov Battalion is based in Mariupol. It liberated Mariupol in 2014 from the DPR, uh, the, the Donetsk People's Republic is uh, the actual name of the DPR. And so I'm sure that the citizens of Mariupol actually think... Um, and probably rightfully so, that the Azov Battalion is actually a good fighting force and is there to defend their city as they are right now. So I don't, so I can't speak on behalf of all of them because obviously I'm not a Ukrainian, but I do think that for the most part, they really don't care about the West or Russia trying to perpetrate that the whole entire group is made up of right-wing fascist extremists. Um, because for the fact of the matter, that's not really true. And secondly, they are fighting and giving it their all in Mariupol. And so there's no reason to sit there and condemn them when they're fighting so hard for their country and trying to defend the, um, amount, the territory of land that they are currently in, which is Mariupol. So I hope I've answered that question pretty well. And we're going to move on to one more question, and then we're going to start covering the Eastern Front news. And the next question we have here is from CH with a donation of $18. They say, my theory is Putin is planning on using a scapegoat, maybe a general, to blame all the brutality and incompetence on uh, by spreading rumors that his generals weren't telling him the whole truth. Putin gets plausible not deniability. I think that is actually a pretty reasonable thing to assume because when things go wrong, it's kind of like the playbook. It's all, I don't want to say it's Machiavellian because I don't want to credit something to uh, Machiavelli that may not be his uh, original idea in the book, The Prince. Go read that. That's a very interesting read, by the way. Machiavelli uh, was a very interesting person. But uh, to cover that, that's something that normally happens. Like we see in the Ar Iran-Contra affair um, during Reagan's presidency. Reagan obviously knew what was going on, but they went and got a fall guy for it, and they blamed it on Oliver North. Uh, we've seen that time and time again throughout history. Whenever things go wrong... The people who actually were orchestrating this thing never uh, are blamed for it. In the end, it's always someone else that they've kind of assigned as the fall guy that takes all the blame. And for some reason, they're very good at picking these people because they usually always step up to the plate and just take the blame, which is really interesting to me. But I do have to agree that that seems like it would be a reasonable thing to assume. And so that may be something we see in the future because that would take the blame off Putin. It would make the government look unfavored for a short while you know publicly but it would go away because they'd be like well we can't blame him because his generals were lying to him and they were the real traitors and instead of looking at putin and saying wow this guy sent us into this war knowing full well the state of the military and the actual capability of us winning this war and he still did it anyways you know and they, they would get pissed off at him so i'm sure that the fall guy is kind of in play right now i have a feeling that it wouldn't be 
Oh man, that's a rough one to say though. I feel like it may be Sergei Shogu. If no one knows who Sergei Shogu is, let me show y'all Sergei Shogu. He's the um I spelled that really wrong. He is the Minister of Defense in the Russian Federation. This is the guy right here. Look at him. Moscow Mike. <laughs> I'm just playing by the way. It's a meme at this point, so I'm just going along. But um the uh he is the Minister of Defense, and if anyone would take the blame, I feel like considering that he's the one at the top, he might take the blame. He's been in the office of the Minister of Defense since 2012. So he's been there for quite a while. He's been there 10 years. But that doesn't protect him from the uh, from the wrath of Putin. So he may go, he may not go. Sergei may be like, hey, let me pick someone below me. So that way it, all the heat doesn't get directed at me. It gets directed to someone below me. And I can just stay in the office in disgrace for a little bit. And then try and rebuild um the public's confidence in me and the government's confidence in me again you know at least publicly so that way i can keep my office but i feel like if any fall guy would actually be designated in the military for this terrible operation it would be him because they already had him come out the other day and say russia has achieved all of their primary objectives in ukraine as of now which isn't true and it's setting it, it may be setting him up uh subliminally to become the fall guy over there. And they might say, oh, he was lying. Look, he came out there and said that. We didn't tell him to say that. He's trying to spin the story so that way he doesn't look bad, but he's the reason this happened. So I have to agree with that. So thank you very much for the support and the comment. That was actually a pretty interesting one. And um, hopefully that aside was informational and uh, founded in a decent amount of fact and reason, hopefully. So I thank you very much. And that is the end of this question segment. And now we're going to move on to the Eastern Front and the location unknowns. So we've actually got a decent amount of location unknowns today, around uh, 15 or so. So we're going to see the first bit of location unknown news where we see some direct hits on Russian tanks. Let me show you all this. It's a pretty interesting video. According to the video description, these Russian tanks on the road are being hit by a Ukrainian 120 millimeter mortar. And so we can see that the tanks are moving along and this one just got hit directly on the right side of the tank. I don't know if that detract. Well, actually, no, it, it caused an ammo burnout. We can see that the commander appears to have hot bailed out of the tank. I'm not, wait a minute, hang on. Let me think. No, that was the gunner. The commander didn't hop out yet, but now we can see that that tank's ablaze. We can see up here that it looks like crew of the other vehicles just bailed out. Let me rewind that so that we all can see that again. Right up here at the top part of the screen, I'll rewind it a bit so that we all can see. So this tank's burning out. We can see crew of the BMP-2, I'm assuming it's a BMP-2, running out into the tree line so that way they're not the next victim of this attack. And so now we can see another tank moving forward. It looks like the mortar fire is falling very close to it. But it looks like it's still trying to roll on, and now it's been hit directly. I don't think that was a mortar round. I think that was actually more like an AT. Um, but I'm not entirely sure. You know, then again... The explosion was very quick, so it's not really like we can tell what it was from. Um, but nonetheless, it looks like that tank was entirely destroyed as well, along with one behind it. And so you can get the picture that the Ukrainians are still hammering out the the ground units that have been destroyed in this war. I mean, like they have never slowed down. And especially since they're in the middle of a counterattack, they're obviously not slowing down now. They're probably ramping it up. And the Russians are just almost helpless to it due to not really learning anything in this war, you would think at some point they would start passing down directives and be like, hey, we've learned that the Ukrainians target our, you know, armored columns like this. So we need to start doing this to prevent that. But we can see that the Russians keep on doing the same things and the Ukrainians just keep on doing the same things to their convoys and nothing is changing. It's been an entire month. Really, Really, it's been more than a month. Yeah, it's been more than a month at this point. And we still have not seen the Russians learn anything and changing their tactics actively in these videos. We haven't uh, at all. So uh, we're now going to go to the next video, which is very interesting. We actually hear the whiz and explosion of a shell next to this Ukrainian soldier who's sitting inside of this trench. Now, I'm going to get this on full screen and unmute it first and then play it from the start. Make sure to get that all the way up there. And so here's the video. I'm just going to let you all listen to it. It sounds like it was really close. I like his response. It was kind of a little calm. That guy's got um, that guy's got a lot of um, bravery in him. 
to be under an artillery barrage. And all, all he does is just, he's like, oh, well, that's that's crap. Uh, I got to say, got to commend him. Pretty brave guy right there. Um, you know, then again, he's under circumstances that he has probably been under for a while. So he's probably just grown accustomed to it. But I got to say, you got to hand it to the Ukrainians. They are out there day and day, um, day after day, taking these barrages, these artillery attacks, missile attacks, and so on. And they just sit there and they just deal with it. And then at the end of it, they have such high morale, they're able to push a numerically superior force to theirs out of the country. And it's something impressive. So now we're going to move on to the next video where we can see a toss on the move. Now you can't make this stuff up, okay? The Russians don't the Russians obviously didn't make this video. This is showing our destroyed Russian T seventy two B and this toss is having to move around it. I don't know how long ago this toss well, this T seventy two B was destroyed, but it looks like the toss uh hasn't learned much because it looks like it's moving through the country solo in a way. But anyways, here's the video. So you can see that it is of course another toss, and it looks like this road may be littered behind it with destroyed and damaged vehicles or parts of destroyed vehicles. That's very interesting. But anyways, that's all we got on that video. We're not exactly sure where that toss was spotted. I hate that we can't really get a lot of information as to where this is, um, because I love to try and give as much relevant information as possible and let people know exactly where this is happening so that way if there's any Ukrainians watching, uh, they can hopefully report this and that it'll be pretty recent information. So we're now going to move on to the next bit of location unknown news where we can see Ukrainian buck anti-air system shoot down some kind of aircraft or a drone. We're not exa exactly sure which one it was because the uh, surface to air missile disappeared inside of a cloud and then exploded. But anyways, I'm just going to let y'all see the video. Unfortunately, it's got no audio, but it launches the missile. The missile goes flying upwards into the clouds. It then takes a downward angle, and then it explodes inside of the cloud. So we're not exactly sure what it hit, but it appears that it did make contact with its target and destroy it because we could see some sparks uh, and splinters of sparks flying out of the clouds. So we know that whatever it hit, it was successful in doing so. We're now going to move on to the next bit of location unknown news, where we've seen a Russian convoy hit a mine. So I'm going to show you all this real quick. Uh, I'm not really sure how it hit the mine, because we can see the two vehicles ahead of it, I believe. Well, actually, no, I'm sorry. One vehicle ahead of it um, passed the location of the mine, and then this tank hit it. And it looks like it was a pretty successful hit from how the explosion occurred. I'm no explosion expert, but I believe that that tank was disabled or completely knocked out. I mean, well, actually, it was flipped over. Wow. Now, that's an explosion. It lifted up a 40-something ton tank, probably a 47-ton tank, and flipped it over. So I'm sure that the damage that's been caused to this tank has been severe, to say the least. So I'm sure that the rest of the convoy has halted. It looks like this vehicle is now stopped, and it looks like it's a armored personnel carrier of a sort, because now the infantry inside of this vehicle are now running back to the tank, I guess to see if they can provide some kind of support. We can now see... The troops in the rest of these, what appears to be BMP3s, dismounting, and they're now re uh, trying to run for cover. So that's an interesting video, uh, but that's all the information we have on it. Unfortunately, once again, we don't know the location of that footage. We just know what happened inside of it. Uh, the Ukrainians are now starting to use mines and IEDs more and more, and that's been a question that a lot of people have been asking is, do we have any evidence of them using IEDs and such? And the answer to that question has been no so far. Until now, in the past few days, we started to see that they're using mines and IEDs to an increasing, uh, an increasingly higher amount than we've seen previously. So that's interesting to see, and it shows that the Ukrainians are constantly adapting and evolving their tactics. So if the Russians ever actually do start spreading information down the chain of command and telling people to change uh, their tactics, it looks like the Ukrainians are still switching up their tactics a decent bit, and so it'll be hard for the Russians to actually adapt to the changes. Uh, here in this next bit of footage, we've got a bit of unfortunate news, as we can see the Ukrainian artillery unit uh, appears to have been wiped out. It looks like a, de uh, a sizable amount of the crew may have survived, because this guy is, of course, filming, but the, um, the artillery pieces themselves, along with the supplies, appears to be unusable at this point, but I'll show you all the video. Yeah, yeah, 
вообще близко, прям возле нас. Да, видишь, далеко. Центральный, я второй, где-то 50 метров от нас. А вот оно въебало 20 Приняли, приняли. Какой перекат. За лупу вам. За лупу. Давай, заводи! And so that's very unfortunate. I hate to see that Ukrainian uh, artillery is getting wiped out in some locations. Uh, a lot of people, because I actually did look through the comments on this uh, Reddit post here, and it looks like a lot of people are saying that apparently the artillery didn't um, move fast enough. Usually how artillery operates is that artillery moves to a prepared location. They set up the pieces. They fire a, sal a couple of uh, salvos. And then they immediately load up these pieces, these artillery pieces, as fast as they can, and they move out of there. Because counter-battery is a thing, and that and counter-battery is when the enemy forces see that, our, you know, enemy artillery is coming in, and so they try and triangulate the position of where that artillery fire is coming from, and then they have their own artillery pieces start attacking the other side's artillery, and so hopefully in the process they destroy them. And as it appears there, apparently the Ukrainians didn't move quick enough and it looks like they got hit. So that's unfortunate, but it's not reflective of the losses in the war as a whole, so that's a good thing. We're now going to move on to the next bit of Location Unknown news, where an elderly lady cries tears of joy as the Ukrainians push back through her town and recapture it. I'll show you all that video right here. Good evening, Ukraine. So as you can see right there, she was crying tears of joy, and I'd have to agree as well. I have to say, it's a, it's a sight to see that the Ukrainian army is actually out outsmarting and out and overpowering the Russians and actually pushing them back out of the country in some areas. Hopefully this success doesn't end soon and they can actually manage to recapture a large portion of the ground that the Russians have managed to take over the first week or so of the war. We're now going to move on to the next bit of the news where we can see that Ukrainian civilians um, started to pass over Russian mines that were laid on the road. I gotta say, this is some harrowing footage. Unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately, no one was killed and the mines didn't explode in this video. But they literally just drive over the mines. It's it's wild. Y'all got to see this. So you can see the first guy made it over. And now the second car has made it over. I Man, this is this is suspenseful. I know I know no one gets injured in this video, but this is just suspenseful to watch on my end. Because even again, because these mines have a large amount of explosive power, and if they hit one, if they happen to roll over the top of one. It will blow them sky high. You saw one of these mines. It was probably a similar size. Flip over a tank earlier in the video. So imagine what would happen to a car and the people inside. But this is just, this is dangerous stuff. But they're they're roughing it. And they're getting over the mines safely. And that's something to me that they have the guts and the courage to do something like this. And so that's the end of the video. 
uh, still crazy stuff. I mean, like you don't see that daily. So I guess, guess you got to say, the average Ukrainian is a very brave person to be doing something like that. Got to give it to him. Uh, it's it's a good thing they made it over safely as well because uh, that would be terrible if one of them happened to roll over the mines and explode one um, because that wouldn't end well for anyone in that video. Um, so I'm glad that they got over it safely. And I'm glad that the Russians laid them out in a kind of way that made them a little easy to get over. So, you know, I'm just going to leave that at that. Maybe that's a maybe that's another low morale thing, like they laid them out in that kind of specific way. But anyways, we're now going to move on to the next bit of the video. And I'm going to show you all a destroyed Russian T-80 tank. I'm not really exactly sure what kind of variant of the T-80 series this is. But regardless of what kind it is, it's completely destroyed. And so that's the end of that video. Once again, pretty neat stuff. It's pretty cool to see uh, that the Ukrainians are still wiping out Russian forces across the whole country. At this point, it doesn't even feel like they're wiping them out. It feels like they're just sweeping them up. Like they're just getting rid of these forces that are kind of left in their path. And they're just managing to reclaim more and more ground each day. And we have not heard a single bit of news about anything else going on anywhere in the country. And... I'm going to have to say something about this. Now, I know I don't draw on mainstream news a lot, and this isn't going to be talking about any specific mainstream news um, kind of like channel. This is talking about all of them. A lot of them today said, oh, while the Russians have only withdrawn 20%, you know, only 20% of their forces from the northern area, they're now renewing their attacks and they're airstriking and missile striking the city of Kiev and Chernihiv. But the thing is, is that while they can withdraw forces, that doesn't stop their ability to launch cruise missiles. You know, cruise missiles can be launched from anywhere inside of Russia, Belarus, inside the Northern Front. And it doesn't require soldiers to be on the ground. It's not like there's some kind of limitation to where they're like, oh, we've got like 60,000 soldiers active. So that means we can launch 24 cruise missiles today. Like, that's not how that works. You can have like 10,000 soldiers in the Northern Front or 60 to 70,000 soldiers in the Northern Front, and fire as many cruise missiles and drop as many bombs on the cities as you want. So I don't really know, once again, why they're trying to distort the information in a way to make it unrepresentative of the actual situation. I think they do that to get a whole bunch of views because they hype it up every three days or so. Oh, the Russians are rebuilding strength. They're going to wipe the whole place out. And they just do that over and over. And I bet it gets exhausting to a whole load of people um, who try and watch the mainstream news because they just... I mean, all of them do that, do that, and it's, it's them trying to keep up their ratings in a way, and I don't really care about ratings, I just care about getting the news out. Um, so, that being said, we're going to move on to the next bit of Location Unknown news, where we can see a destroyed Russian vehicle burning. We can actually see a couple of them in this video, but I'll let you all see this. You might be able to hear it. And you might be able to see it a little, but there's an ammo cook-off going on inside of this burning Russian vehicle. And so we're now going to move on to the next bit of news, uh, where we can see that the um there were i'm sorry i butchered that one there uh we can see in the next bit of location unknown news that the ukrainians have once again now i don't know how they're doing this but they managed to capture mistas at like an unparalleled rate to all the other vehicles they managed to capture it's like mistas are just so catchable in a way i don't know why it seems like the crews abandoned them very quickly and they just leave them all in running condition so here's the video once again more captured mistas it's unbelievable how many of these the russians have lost here's one okay here's the first one there's one back there there's two in this video again entirely in running condition hardly any damage at all except for what appears to be this front side skirt but that's not really damaged that's superficial and so they're in running condition the russians are pretty much supplying the ukrainians with brand new mistas and i'm not sure if they had any before the war but they certainly have a decent amount of them now 
And so we're now going to move on to the next bit of location unknown news, where we're going to see, okay, now this is something else that a lot of people have asked about, and we finally got information in the show that it is happening. We can see Russian deserters that have abandoned the Russian army and have been captured by the Ukrainians actually joining the Ukrainian army. Here's the pictures of that to show you all that that's actually happening. These are um, Russian volunteers from the Russian military service, as you can see in the title, um, getting instructed on how to use an in-law. These people deserted from the Russian army. They're still wearing the Ratnik camo that the Russians issue, but now they put blue armbands on it and they're fighting for the Ukrainians. A lot of people have been asking, has this happened? I said there's been no picture evidence or anything to show that it is. And now today... We've gotten the first bit of evidence to show that they're now, in fact, compiling an entire legion out of the Russian prisoners that have been captured that are now going to fight for the Ukrainian side. We don't actually have an exact number as to how large this, how large this legion is, so we'll have to wait some time to see if we can get that kind of figure. But just the fact that there are Russians now siding with the Ukrainians that were just previously fighting in the Russian army that is invading Ukraine says a lot about the morale of the Russian soldiers and shows that they're even willing to give up their old lives in their country and probably have the chance of never returning to do what they think is right. That tells you a lot about this war and how the Russian army, the average soldier in the Russian army is looking at it, most likely. We're now going to move on to the next bit of location unknown news, where we're going to see a Ukrainian farmer getting an engineer vehicle. Um, these have been rare. We haven't really seen a lot of these being captured, seen some of them being destroyed. But once again, you can see a Ukrainian farmer is getting some new hardware to use in this year's harvest. A very interesting vehicle. It looks like some kind of bulldozer slash crane. But I may be wrong. I'm not exactly an expert on Russian uh, engineering vehicles in a way. And there's just so many vehicles out there in the world that I can't be an expert on all of them. I'm sorry to say that. But I couldn't be an expert on all of them or otherwise I would have to like give up streaming and start reading about them all day to try and get a concept of what each one does. So unfortunately, I can't tell you all the ex exact kind of vehicle. It just kind of looks like it had a plow attachment on the front as well as a crane. But then again, that's just my observations, and I'm making a whole bunch of assumptions saying that. So take that with a grain of salt. We just know it's an engineering vehicle of a sort. We're now going to move on to the second to last bit of location unknown news, where we're going to see a Russian column being destroyed. It appears that it was destroyed piecemeal in a way, but you can see the convoy in the first bit of video lined up here on the road. Uh, we can now see in the next one, the convoy appeared to have been trying to spread out off the road after they got attacked to try and, I guess, get some more distance in between each other. But it appears that that didn't succeed, as we can see one of the vehicles exploding. It looks like this Mista was abandoned. So, you know, the Ukrainians got another free Mista, of course. That seems to be a recurring thing. We can now see another destroyed vehicle on the, on the road. Uh, also, another one that looks like it may be a... I really can't tell. I would love to say which one that is, but I'm going to have to plead ignorance because I can't really tell. It's just too blurry for me to see. But now we got some footage here on the ground. It looks like it's trying to show the destroyed and abandoned Russian vehicles from this convoy. And the footage is so shaky, I still really can't tell what this stuff is. Wait a minute, was that tank flipped over? Well, let me make sure I saw that right. Uh... No, it wasn't. It looks like maybe a pontoon on top of a kind of like armored personnel carrier. I'm not entirely sure. We can see some Kamasas out there in the field. And some more destroyed rush fields. A flipped over BMP, most likely. And a TOR. This is a TOR. Um, Anti-air system. So, pretty pretty expensive hardware. I think this thing costs about $15 million. So, that's a $15 million vehicle that was completely destroyed. And that's the end of the video. And so we're now going to move on to the last bit of location unknown news where we can see a Russian heavy flamethrower abandoned. Um, according to the title of this, the 93rd Mechanized Brigade called the Kolodny Yar um, captured this, uh, this uh, heavy flamethrower. I haven't seen one of these before, um, so I'm not exactly sure as to its capabilities. And I could pull it up on stream, but I'll probably do that at a later time so that way we can keep the Eastern Front news uh, rolling through at a steady pace. 
But we're now going to move on to the news around Sumy because we've covered all the location unknown news. And we can see that the Ukrainians are still being met with mostly success in some areas and some unfortunate minor defeats in others, such as their artillery unit being destroyed in some location around the country. We're now going to move on down to the Sumy area, where we have heard no news today. Uh, it appears that the Sumy area is having intermittent bouts of combat and fighting, but it doesn't appear that it is a regular occurrence, at least as far as the video evidence coming out is concerned. So at the moment, we actually don't have any news today to suggest that anything has once again happened in Sumy, but we do know that the uh, territorial defense forces inside of Sumy have been pushing out of the city, and it appears that they are reclaiming villages along the roads. So we're now going to move on down to the area of Troishtinets, where I of course have to make the same disclaimer and say that it appears that once again, no action has happened down here from either side as far as the video evidence is concerned. So I'm not entirely sure as to the situation. The last we heard, the Ukrainians were pushing the Russians back at a um, terrifically fast pace. It was around 10 miles in one day, but we haven't gotten any information to show that they pushed farther up the road, and we haven't, showed any, uh, we haven't seen any information to suggest that the Russians have halted this counterattack in this area. So we're still waiting for information to come out, but that is the situation as of the moment that we know of. So we're now going to move on down to the area of Kharkiv, which has had a little bit of action today as far as bombardments on the city and things that have been captured or found in the area. We're going to start off first with some Russian anti-personnel grenades that have been found in the area of Kharkiv. As you can see here, these are called a POM-3 anti-personnel mine. So we're going to pull this thing up, POM-3, in use. Let's see if we can get a video of this thing actually working so that way we can see what it looks like. Uh, let me go to YouTube, maybe POM-3, mine. Let's see if we got anything here. Uh, unfortunately, we don't. It's like a whole bunch of rap songs and rats save humans from landmines. So, unfortunately, we don't actually have anything on the POM-3. I wish I could show the capabilities of the POM. Uh, let's see. The base unit ejects the fragmentation. Okay. Well, pretty much reading this description, it sounds a lot like a bouncing Betty. It just shoots up into the air a little bit and then explodes, um, you know, a few feet above the ground, uh, apparently sending a fragmentation radius of around 16 meters, which is actually pretty large. That's, uh, for American viewers, that's like... Mm, 40, 40, 50 feet or so. So, very interesting. I don't really know if these are a war crime. I don't think anti-personnel mines like this are a war crime. I think they're um, completely usable. But hopefully, Ukrainian forces are more aware of where they're putting their step because these little things are nasty, much like a bouncing Betty was in World War II. So you don't want to step on this thing because if you step on it and you step off of it, this little thing is going to shoot up into the air and kill everyone. So... Um, they might want to be pretty careful about that, but we're now going to move on to the next bit of loca- uh, well, actually the next bit of Kharkiv news. I get so used to saying location unknown news. Sorry about that, y'all. We can see a downed helicopter in the Kharkiv area. Completely destroyed. It has a Z on it. Really interesting that they're now putting Zs on the helicopters as well. But it does have a Z on it, and it appears there was some kind of Mi-24 series helicopter, but it has now been burned out entirely, and... It looks like it'll need a decent amount of repairs, and I don't think insurance will cover that. Uh, we don't really have much to talk about rather than it being an MI-24 that was destroyed. And so we're now going to move on to the last bit of news inside of Kharkiv. And some kind of missile hit something in Kharkiv that caught on fire, and it burned so brightly that people filmed it all over. And there was multiple perspectives, but I only picked one to just get the point across and keep the news brief and just show you what happened. The fire that was burning after this missile hit its target was so bright, it made the it made the whole entire area look like it was dawn. So I'm going to show this to y'all because it's it's insane. I don't know what was hit, but hopefully we can get some kind of news to see what it actually was. But as you can see, the whole entire area is lit up from this massive fire that's going on in the distance. And it is bright. I don't know exactly what that is, once again. But whatever it hit... It's been it's something serious. I don't know if that's a gas main that it's hit and it's just expelling the gas out of the pipes and it's burning in incredibly brightly. I'm not really sure. But nonetheless, a very terrible explosion for sure. And so we're now going to move on to the um, next bit of, of Eastern Front news and then we will take the next three to five questions. 
Down in the area of Izium, it appears that the Ukrainians are now starting to get a decent amount of success there destroying Russian units. As we can see, multiple T-72B3s that have been destroyed in the Izium area in this one video right here. Oh, it's got That's one T-72B3. This one kind of looks like it was abandoned for the most part. And I'm not really sure. Let's make sure that I'm saying something correctly here. There's another one. There's a third one. Yeah, so there's about three, at least. Мы просто возьмем и спиздим. Вон их сколько, блядь. Раз, вон там два. So, there you have it. Three T-72B3s that were destroyed. Just for everyone to remember, let's pull up how many T-72B3 uh, B3s the Russians have. Uh, T-72 operators and variants. Hopefully we can get an exact number. Uh, Russian Federation. Where is the Russian Federation? Uh, T-72 BMs, 8,000 in reserve. Uh, they had 200 T-72, uh, 270 T-72 B3s in 2013. Uh, they had an additional 143 delivered in 2014. So the total size of that tank force is around 400-ish. And we know that the Russians have lost around... Oh boy, I think about 500, 600 uh, main battle tanks at this point, and we've seen a lot of T-72B3s get destroyed. So there may be a massive gap now in the actual T-72B3 numbers they had initially going into the war and what they have now. Um, so going off of Wikipedia's numbers, as far as those can be trusted, I'm not really sure. It appears that they may be suffering a decent amount of losses to their T-72B3 force. We'll just have to see if any actual public information comes out after war. Of course it probably won't, because the Russians don't want to show how poorly everything went, unless if it's now in their, unless if it's in their benefit to show that stuff. So we'll just have to see if we can ever get any official numbers as to exactly how many T-72B3s were destroyed, and then try and approximate what percentage of their T-72B3 force they have in total was destroyed inside of Ukraine. And so now we've actually covered all the news in the Eastern Front. And so we're now about to move on to the Southern Front. But before we do, we're going to answer three to five more questions from the chat. And so that being said, what do we got, Matthew? Okay, so just a heads up to everybody. It looks like we currently have about 25 or so questions in the Super Chats and quite a few other questions as well. So first up, we have one from uh, a longtime channel supporter, Zeta Lane, with a donation of $40. She says... Do we not have any intelligence about Russian troop movements heading toward the Donbass? Have they withdrawn across the border and are traveling outside Ukraine? Regrouping on that scale would be hard to hide. We're not entirely sure. We haven't actually gotten a lot of information about troop movements in the Donetsk, Luhansk, Donbass area in general. We do know that they have tried to push out of the Donetsk and Luhansk borders to a small degree because we know that they've reached several Donetsk. But they haven't appeared to be doing much beyond that. It appears that they've kind of stalled as far as our information has gone. So, uh, we don't really know if they have withdrawn the Russian side of the forces, and it's just the DPR and LPR that are left there to fight. Um, so, unfortunately, I can't really answer that question exactly. But I'm sure that if the United States is able to show on satellite footage exactly what the Russians are doing day by day, they probably know exactly what's going on in the Donbass area. It's just that they haven't released that data um, so that way they're not uh, compromising any information they're giving the Ukrainians and making the Russians change their plans too much. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the support to the channel. You've been, a, you've been a return supporter multiple times, and it helps me out a lot, and it helps me to continue to run the channel. And so I thank you so much once again. It means a lot to me, and I hope I answered that question the best I could. And so I thank you once again, and that being said, we're going to move on to the next question. And the next uh, question we have up is from Freedom First. He puts in a donation of $20, and he did ask me to retract this message here, so I will skip it. Uh, next up, we have another $20 donation from Freedom First, who says, The Russians fighting in Mariupol are going to be in for a rude awakening when they find out how the war in the rest of the country is actually going. They will be. I think they're actually... Um... I think they actually know what's going on. It's just that they've been told, listen, folks, like, listen, guys, this is what the Russian commander should probably said to him. Listen, guys, the war is going terribly. The whole entire Russian government relies on us securing one victory. And so we have to put everything into this one victory 
So that way the cameras back home have something to look at all the time. Because if they don't, the war will look like it's going terribly because there's nothing else for us to talk about that's good in the rest of the country. And that you can see because we have not seen any more Russian videos come out from the northern area or the eastern area or even the southern area for that matter. All of the Russian videos now that come out on Russian state media are from Mariupol only, which tells me that the only place they feel happy reporting that they're winning because they don't see that changing anytime soon, is Mariupol. And so they must be in a stalemate everywhere else, or they're losing land everywhere else. It's one or the other, depending on the situation. And then from the Ukrainian side, we get more information to show that that either is the case or is not the case. Um, so I thank you very much for the support, and I hope that I've answered your question in a way. And I do think that those soldiers will be in for shock if they haven't heard the news yet, that while they won Mariupol, the military around the rest of the country hasn't won squat and they're actually losing most of everything at this point so i thank you very much for the support i hope that answers your question in a way and so we're going to answer two more questions from the chat and then we're going to move on to the southern front and so what do we got matthew and the next one we have is from andrew J, who puts in a donation of 15 dollars. they say what do you think ukraine needs to do to hold out russia in donbass can't they bring troops from western ukraine I think, because we're not exactly sure what the situation in the Donbass is, We some maps say that they've taken everything east of Izium, and then they're pushing down towards Izium from Kharkiv. And so I'm not really sure if that is exactly the case, because we know that the Ukrainians are still holding on to Severodonetsk and also Rubizhny, which is a little bit north and east of the city. And so I don't really know what the situation is up there. I know that the Ukrainians are holding them as of now because the Russians haven't broadcasted any successes that they've gotten in this area. So we know that the Ukrainians are holding or otherwise the Russians would have said otherwise and shown it. Um, so going off of that, the Ukrainians could probably start sending in more troops from the west of the country into the east to try and support and bolster these units if they need to. But I think at the moment they actually don't really want to because there's really no reason for it but if that situation does change i'm sure that the ukrainians will of course provide the forces needed to um stave off or hold the russian invasion where it is um so i hope that's answered your question to a pretty good degree and i thank you once again for the support and being a return supporter of our channel and so that being said we're going to move on to the last question of this segment and the last question of the segment goes to zuka with a ten dollar donation they say, thank you for the coverage and your take on the events as they unfold live. I thank you very much for the support, and I do try and make sure that all this is broadcasted as live as possible. Of course, over the last 24 hours, so some of the stuff is about a day old by the time it gets on here. But I do try and make sure that it is as live as possible. And if, if all of y'all appreciate uh, the effort that I'm putting into this and trying to make sure that the news is live and factual, make sure to hit the like button because it helps us out a lot in the algorithms and it helps us get out to more and more people. So if you like the news and, uh, you know, obviously if you like the news, you probably think that this is worthy of other people seeing. And so if you hit the like button, it's guaranteed that more people will be able to get this news daily and hopefully they won't be hearing the hashed out, milled out stuff that they come out with on the mainstream news to just up their ratings and their viewership. So I thank you very much for the support. And that is the last question of this segment. We will get to all the super chats tonight and we will answer a decent amount of the questions that um, are from the live chat, about three of them or more, depending on how quickly, how quickly we get through the questions. And so now we're going to move on to the Southern Front where today we've seen some news develop around Severodonetsk because in Lysychansk we've seen some damage. I'm going to show you all this right here real quick. As you can see, this apartment building appears to have taken some kind of direct hit to its upper floors, which has now caved in the roof and has destroyed a decent amount of the apartments in the central part of that building. We're not really sure if any civilian casualties were involved in this attack, but I bet there probably was considering it's a residential building and people and civilians just don't cease to exist once a war starts. And so once again, we see the Russians targeting residential buildings and such and it's a terrible thing to see and so we see them actually trying to rescue some people out of another damaged building which does confirm that there were probably civilians in the last one and who knows how many are buried under the rubble how many of them had children that will never see their parents again or how many parents will never see their son uh, grow up to be the great boy they thought they would be and so you just never know and i hate to know that the russians keep doing this stuff and hopefully this this will end this will end soon I hope that's the case, 
because it's terrible to see this stuff happen day in and day out to a country that just doesn't deserve this kind of thing because they've never done they haven't really done anything to anyone and so i don't really know why um some people you know like pro russians and stuff believe that this is just a part of a war it shouldn't be you know of course we don't live in a perfect world so of course there will always be a little bit of this in every war but we should always try and make sure that as a nation that we ensure that we don't inflict civilian casualties while we're in a war and other countries also do the same so i hate to see this and i hope that these so i hope that no not a lot of people are killed in these buildings because it's terrible business to see this happen so now we're going to move on to the news around the rest of luhansk where we've seen a t-72 a russian t-72 get destroyed in the luhansk region i'm of course going to have to mute this because it has copyrighted audio but as you can see here nice little infographic kind of thing but that's a t-72 that just got wiped out And so that's the remnants of the T-72. Wait a minute, hang on, hang on. Wait a minute. Nope, that's not a T-62. I mean, T-72, that's a T-64. T-64 BV specifically because of its ERA layout and also the wheel configuration. It's a T-64 for sure. So it seems like this uh, video was mislabeled. But nonetheless, it is a Russian tank. We do see the Z on it that was wiped out. So it's a good thing to know that in the Luhansk region, it appears that the Russians are getting a decent amount of vehicles destroyed, but we're not sure as to how much ground has been covered by them or if the Ukrainians are mounting any successful counterattacks in that area. It's kind of a black hole of information at the moment. Excuse me, but we will try and update this information as time goes on, of course. And so now we're going to move on to the next bit of news. Uh, we've gotten a decent bit around the Donetsk area. As we can see today, an SU-24, presumably Russian, was on an attack run um, somewhere in the country. I'll let y'all see this video. It's right out there. It's the uh, pixels on the screen. So you can see there some pretty interesting stuff, nonetheless. I don't really, I'm, I'm not really sure if it was Russian. The Ukrainians also operate SU 25s, but not a large amount of them. So we're not entirely sure. Who's you SU-25? Uh, well, yeah, who's SU-25 it was, but we do know that one was on an attack run in the Donetsk region today. So we're going to move on to the next bit of news in, around the city of Donetsk, where we've seen some more SPGs in action on the DPR side. Actually, this is the LPR, so I'm going to show you all this. And so um, the video is somewhat short, but you got to see uh, more pro-Russian artillery in use, probably targeting civilian areas, which is unfortunate business. And, you know, I mean, like a lot of people, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll avoid that comment. I just, I, I have great disdain for the Russian army and pro-Russian forces and their disregard for uh, civilians in this war. That's all I got to say about that. We're now going to move on to the village of Marinka where we've seen today more evidence of white phosphorus being used by the Russian side. So you can see there, that is a white phosphorus attack. White phosphorus is a war crime. Uh, if you use white phosphorus, you're supposed to be able to prove that the people who were killed by the white phosphorus were killed in the blast and not being burned alive. You can see right here that clearly no one's going to get killed in the blast because this appears to have bursted in air. And so it's nothing more than the phosphorus uh, the uh, white phosphorus particulates that are now streaming down to the ground and will burn soldiers, civilians, children, and the like without without really regard. You know, of course, something that's burning will burn everything without regard for what it is. And so who knows what's under the blast path of this white phosphorus airburst, but whatever's under it, God help it, because it probably didn't live. This type of stuff. I mean, really, the U.S. should draw the line with white phosphorus attacks as well. Uh, not just covering nuclear, biological, and chemical. I would kind of call. I would kind of classify this as a um, chemical attack in a way. I mean, like it, white phosphorus is a 
kind of chemical. It's not exactly mustard gas or chlorine, but I feel like that should be included in that description or the, or the description of weapons that would get the United States involved should be extended to include white phosphorus because it's about as gruesome as poison gas or chemical attack. Well, poison gas or biological attacks in a way. So with that being said, we're now going to move on from the Donetsk area and we're going to move on to the Mariupol area. Uh, inside the Mariupol area, we've gotten a decent bit of news today. And if a lot of y'all are thinking that the map is getting cluttered here in Mariupol, I do have to agree entirely. Uh, the map here in Mariupol, there's just been so much news that's been going on over the past seven days that all of it's kind of been getting clumped on top of each other nearly. And so this won't be the case anymore. We'll actually be starting a new week tomorrow. It'll be day one of week six, I believe. So we'll be, of course, well, I think week five, week six. I'm not exactly sure yet. We'll have to see. Um, but this map will be cleared and we'll have brand new points for day one tomorrow and the coloring system will restart um, to show which uh, which day these events happened. So the first bit of news that we've gotten inside of Mariupol is the Chechens taking out the worst enemies in this war, the traffic lights. The traffic lights have held back the Russians too much. They are, of course, fascist. So we can see in this video, they're trying to wipe them out. Some kind of cleansing in a way or something. У нас работают две группы. Одна группа идет с Мольской бульвара до Азовстальской. Вторая группа от Азовстальской до проспекта до... So as we can see here, the Chechen is talking about how the fascist red lights have been oppressing them for years and they're finally getting back at them by invading Ukraine and shooting up the red lights. Of course I'm joking, I don't really know what that guy was saying, but it's still silly that they open up their pro-Russian video with them shooting at a red light. Like, I wish uh, we I could know what they're saying. We're still kind of looking into translators a little, but honestly, with how the scheduling works of how these videos are constructed... There's not enough time, really, for translators to go through and translate these videos. Uh, but we'll look into it as time goes on, and I'll see if it is a possibility in the future. But nonetheless, um, here's the rest of the video. And so that's the end of that video. Of course, I don't know what the Chechen was talking about. Of course, I can't speak Russian. I'm assuming he's speaking Russian. Um, so I don't know what he was talking about, but it's just weird that they're shooting red lights. Like, what does that prove or show the Russian public? Like, oh, yes, they're shooting a red light. Um, so we're now going to move on to the next bit of news inside of Mariupol, where we can see firefights still ongoing in Mariupol. There has been no stop in firefight footage this entire week in Mariupol, which shows that this city is being heavily contested right now in between both the Ukrainians and the Russians. We are seeing um, the Alamo slash Stalingrad occurring in the 21st century right before our very eyes as the Ukrainians hold this city for as long as they can. Unfortunately, like Stalingrad, there really is no way for the Ukrainians to relieve this city or encircle the Russians around it. Although, the Ukrainians, of course, may surprise us. We don't really know. They are conducting a lot of successful counterattacks around the rest of the country, so we'll have to see if they're able to relieve the city of Mariupol in time. But nonetheless, here's the video of the firefighting that occurred today inside of Mariupol. <laughs> I like this uh I like this little dopey guy here in this video. Like he's they're trying to look cool of course, but I think most of this guy's spray was hitting the wall right in front of him. You can kind of see him in the left side of the video, but I'm going to show you all that again. Look at this guy. He's back here to the left. You can't see him yet, but you'll see him a little as the video goes on. He's just lathering up this wall with bullets. Like he's not he's not hitting anything down range. It's all almost going into this wall. See right back there, there's the gun that's hitting this wall. It's not the Ukrainian shooting at them, it's him shooting at the wall. That's that's just poor God, God. I mean, that's terrible. I mean, like, if you can't shoot if you can't shoot a gun and and you're that bad at aiming that you're hitting a wall literally three feet in front of you when there's a whole 90 degree arc 
beside you where you could fire into the open air although you know some of that's occupied by a btr 82 i've never seen anything like this this guy has no clue how to aim a gun And so you can kind of see that happen again. It looked like once again they started hitting the wall up here with something. And I gotta tell you, I don't know what the whole aim of that was. Was it to make it look like the Ukrainians were shooting at him and it was bouncing off the wall? Or was that just poor marksmanship on that guy's part? I mean, obviously, if that guy is such a bad shot, I bet you the Russians wouldn't want that highly publicized. So I think that was actually an attempt to make something look like action was happening. Um, but it, it came off poorly. Obviously, we could all tell off the bat that it was just some guy off camera shooting up the wall right above this guy's head. So, I'm going to let y'all discuss in the chat, was that guy doing that to make this video more believable, or is he just that bad of a shot? Either way, it looks terrible for the Russians, but I'd like to see what y'all think in the comments about this stuff, because it's silly, really. Uh, so, we're now going to move on from this video to the next video inside of the city of Mariupol, where we can see more footage of the damage inside of the city. And this actually includes the children's theater as well. So you see the children's theater was entirely destroyed. And what's terrible about the Mariupol Children's Theater is that this actually survived the Second World War intact. And the Germans actually fought for this town and captured it. Let me pull that up for y'all, actually. Let me let me show that to y'all. Battle of Mariupol, 1941. Oh, wait a minute, that's the wrong one. Uh, let's see. Let's see, uh, we'll just type in Nazi occupation of Mariupol. Uh, the city was occupied from 1941 to 1943. Um, let's see, let me go through here and show this real quick. Uh, settlement, recent history. Okay, well, apparently it's not going to tell us directly. Hmm. It's not going to tell us directly about it. Come on. There's got to be something. Come on, there's got to be... I mean, like... you got to be kidding me. Can't we just get a quick little article? Apparently we can't. I'll just try and explain it a little bit. I was wanting to get some sources to back this up. But the city was taken by the Germans. There was a decent, uh, there was a little bit of fighting that occurred to take this city. The, Rus the Germans took it and held it for a few years. And in the entire process of the battle to take the city and the battle where they subsequent, subsequently lost the city in 1943, this children's theater was not touched once. It was damaged slightly, but it wasn't destroyed at all. And now in the Russian invasion, they've gone through and destroyed the children's theater. And that says a lot. When, a children, when the children's theater can survive one of the most horrendous regimes that this world has ever seen, but it cannot survive Russia's regime. And that tells you a lot about the Russian standpoint in this war, when they can do something that not even the Germans could in the 40s. So as you can see, entirely destroyed, the whole entire thing. Now we can see uh, sky rises that have been destroyed. This one appears to have been split in two nearly by some kind of explosion. Not really exactly sure which it is what kind of explosion it was, but nonetheless extensive damage was incurred on this building. But it looks like the blocks behind it actually weren't affected all too much, these two in particular. Although we may not be able to see it um, because it's on a, it's drone footage, but maybe those buildings have been damaged as well.
so I'm glad to see that the Ah, oh, man, I don't know what these things... A, a basil I think the Eastern Orthodox Church calls churches basilicas. I'm glad to see that the basilica hasn't been damaged. Hopefully that can survive the war. Uh, let's pull up the Mariupol Basilica, and let's see if we can get any information to see if it has a significant amount of historical value. Um, let's see here. Mariupol. I'm sure that this shows up as a major landmark, that one... Um, Maybe not. I may be wrong. I think I am wrong. Apparently it doesn't show up on the Wikipedia. We're just going to skip through that. I'm glad that it hasn't been damaged so far. Hopefully it stays undamaged throughout the course of this war. So that way they don't lose more historical structures that will probably never return. So now we're going to go to a heinous Russian crime. I had never seen anything like this. The Russians directly attacked a Red Cross depot. You can see the damage that's clearly visible on this building and the Red Cross that was clearly on top of it before they destroyed this building. Wiped it out completely. And you can also see Red Cross trucks outside the building. This is a Red Cross depot that was being used and was attacked by the Russians. Now that is something that is unheard of. And I'm glad... You know, while there's been a little bit of a little bit of a um, flip flop with the Red Cross, you know, because the Red Cross went over and played nice with the Russians, and no one really liked him for that. They are active in Ukraine. There, there's a Red Cross depot right there that's in Ukraine that was being used at the time. So we do know that they are helping out the Ukrainians, and I have to say I'm very glad that we did a fundraiser to help out the Red Cross because hopefully those funds can go into helping to replace that lost equipment right there that they've suffered inside of Mariupol. Hopefully. So we're now going to move on to the next news uh, that we've seen, where we can see citizens try to get food and water as shelling and gunfire is heard in the background. I'm just going to let y'all see this video. It speaks for itself. So you can see they're lined up for food. There's gunfire and shelling going on in the background, and the shell will fall really close to them near the end of the video. It's terrible to think that people are having to live under such adverse conditions. I really hate that. Um, fortunately, a decent amount of people have started to make it out of the city, but once again, a lot of people are stuck there, and all, all I can do really is hope and pray that they'll be safe. Because the war is a dangerous thing, especially with the Russians involved. And so you never know if all these people may get killed like those people who were lined up for food at a supermarket in Kharkiv with a missile strike just hitting in the middle of the queue. You never know, and so I hope that they will be safe. And so, um, we're now going to move on to the rest of the Southern Front, and I'm going to explain that there has been no news from the rest of the southern front. A lot of people are wondering what's happening in Kherson. We know that the Ukrainians were attacking it days ago, but as of now, there has still been no news that's come out of Kherson. So we don't know exactly what's going on over here, but we do know that the Russians have not managed to rebuff the counterattack from the Ukrainians. And so I believe that the counterattack is still full swing and has not been slowed as of now. Uh, we've also gotten no news along the rest of the southern front. And so that is actually the end of the news today is what we got in Mariupol. And so that being said, we are now going to start answering the questions. But before we do, how many Super Chats do we have, Matthew? So we currently have about uh, 26 Super Chats at the moment. All right, so let's get, um, let's get to them. What do we got? Okay, so first up, we have a $25 donation from Zeta Lane once again. Uh, she says, here's a little contribution for all the vigilance and good work of the mods on the channel tonight. Nothing is getting by them. And yes, Zito, I have been on the ball tonight when it comes to uh, keeping the chat in line. Uh, we love free speech, but unfortunately, there are a few things that we don't allow in the chat, and politics is one of them. Uh, but thank you very much for the compliment. Uh, next question of the night is from uh, Ligma Sigma, who puts in a donation of $14.01 and says, no comment, best coverage. Thank you very much for the support. I'm glad that you think this is the best coverage out there. Make sure to share it with your friends if you think it's good coverage, because I'm sure that a lot of people would like to hear it if you think that. And so thank you once again for the nice comment and also the support, because it's going to help the channel keep running. And so thank you once again, and we're going to move on to the next question. 
And the next one is from, let's see, uh, Maxi Mad, who puts in a donation of $10. They say, I think front line near east of Kiev has changed when the Ukrainian army apparently liberated villages of Sevet, Sevetel line. I'm not sure how to say that. I'm not uh, sure how to say any of that, actually. So I'm just going to copy and paste that into the chat uh, so everybody knows what I'm talking about. It said, fighting still going on at Nova Basando. Nova Basando. I'm looking at the map here. I see the town that they're talking about, Svetlina, uh, but I don't see the other ones. I'm sorry if I butchered that as well. I tried my best right there, but, you know, once again, I'm not a native Ukrainian speaker, so I can't get all the names right all the time. So... Uh, thank you for letting us know that information. We will try and update the map if we do get any video evidence to show that. Uh, but as of the moment, we don't. And also, that wasn't actually included in, uh, by me as captured territory by the Russians. So I actually don't have to change anything there as of now. But thank you once again for letting us know. And the support, of course, because it always helps us run this channel. And so we're going to move on to the next question. And our next question is from Ben C., who puts in a donation of $10 and says, Hey, Enforcer. Can you break down the Russian units from the largest to the smallest? Uh, like, for example, can you explain what each kind of division consists of down to what a BTG is, Madre made up of? Maybe make it a video. I think I could. Yes, I, I could try. That would, of course, take a decent amount of research from me because I don't know the actual complete um, chain of command and the actual units and their composition and sizes and stuff right off the bat. I just know that they have around... Um, I believe 200 to 300 BTGs, and I don't know how they um, put those under further commands as the you know sizes go up, like how divisions and brigades are set up in the Russian army. But the B a BTG is around 800 guys, um, and I believe that around eh, 200 to 300 of those are officers or ish or so. It's composed of around, I believe, 10 main battle tanks and around 30 armored personnel carriers each. Um, so I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea of what a BTG looks like. Um, but as far as that, I could make a video and do some research on it. And maybe that could be one of the first videos on the channel. So I thank you very much for the support. And I thank you very much for the suggestion. We may look into that. And so that being said, we're going to move on to the next question. And the next question of the night is from Mark Bohychuk. He puts in a donation of $10 and says, Enforcer, from what we've been seeing with the tank losses, what do you think armies will look like in, say, 50 years? Will tanks even have a purpose anymore? I feel like the tank will always be around, but I feel like the tank is probably going to start undergoing some major changes in the years to come. Uh, for example, I think they're going to go from being an armored vehicle like they are now to probably just being some kind of mobile assault gun that has enough armor to try and stop small arms fire but it won't have enough armor to do anything beyond that because it seems like armor is now useless. It's kind of like the phase uh, the tanks went through in design during uh, the post-World War uh, II period where anti-tank weapons became so effective. All, every, every country in the world was like, what's the point of armor? And we could see that reflected in the Leopard 1 incredibly well because it had nearly no armor compared to a normal tank. Um, so I think that they're going to start going through a phase like that, but I don't think the tank is totally out of the action yet, and I don't think it will be in about 50 years' time, because there is always a role for um, equipment that is made, uh, and, and it has to fill that role. Tanks kind of took over the role of assault guns in a way over the past few decades, well, really over the past century since they've existed, uh, and now we can see that they're starting to kind of reach a phase of obsolescence, at least the current designs of tanks are. And so I think they will go through a change, but I don't think they'll be entirely taken out. Because you can see some things, like an assault gun, that really are obsolete, but they're still used in limited numbers here and there. So um, that's kind of my stance on that. But thank you once again, Mark, for being a return supporter. I hope you like that we included uh, the, the version of the intro that you made with the English translations in it, because I made sure to do that today. And I hope you like that. So I thank you very much for being a return supporter. And I thank you very much for the question. That's an interesting question. And I guess in 50 years time, I'll just have to look back at this stream and maybe run another stream in 50 years and be like, guys, I was right or I was wrong about what happened with the tanks. So I thank you very much for the support. And we're going to move on to the next question. Okay, and the next question of the night is from Arlie John, who puts in a donation of $10. They say, good evening, group, and good evening to you too, Arlie, and thank you very much for your support. The next question of the night is from... 
Hello? Prehistorian. Can you hear me? Uh, you cut out there for a second. So could you start that one over from the beginning? Yeah. Uh, this question is from Paryuchan44, who puts in a donation of $10. They say, as a military historian, please explain the rights of a breakaway province and the rights of another country to support them. How does, how does this apply to the U.S. helping Taiwan to leave China? Uh, the U.S. isn't really helping Taiwan to leave China, per se. There's kind of a long um, political history, and that would take like a far away into the 1949 Chinese Civil War to explain what happened with that. But, the, but Taiwan is actually officially called the Republic of China, and the Republic of China actually used to control most of mainland China prior to the communists taking control. There was a civil war, and the um, Republic of China's government was then pushed out of the country, and they fled to Taiwan, where they still exist today. And you can tell that, and what's really cool, okay, not to get too much into Chinese history, because this is a Ukrainian history, well, not Ukrainian history, Ukrainian war and its history in a way, but Chiang Kai-shek, who was the leader of the Republic of China, we'll pull up with the Republic of China just to show y'all uh, their initial borders before the commies kind of like overran them in a way. I'll show you all that. Republic of China. Where's the map? This map is a little incorrect because a decent amount of this land was actually controlled by warlords. Um, but this area in green is kind of a general idea of what they controlled. Um, but nonetheless, to move on through that, they got defeated by the communists in the Chinese Civil War. Millions of people died. Um, you know, because every single Chinese war in history ever involves the death of millions of people for some reason. I don't know why. I guess it's just because they have a massive population. And so at the end of this war, <laughs> the uh, Republic of China got pushed out of the country. And so we didn't actually help them get to that point. And we're not really helping them break away from China because historically they are China. Um, and so they never really cease to exist. That's actually what China really is. It's just Taiwan. And then um, the actual China that we call China, uh, which is called the People's Republic of China, really just holds the land right now. But the Chinese and, uh, well, the, um, let me make sure I get the names right, because the names are really important when you're talking about the Chinese and the t in Taiwan. The People's Republic of China never has actually signed a peace treaty with the Republic of China, and so they're still kind of at war in a way. And of course, Taiwan, if they had the ability, would try and shoot back at China and probably retake the country, but I don't think that'll happen anytime soon. Um, so uh, that's that's not exactly how it works uh, with China. We didn't actually help them break away. But the thing is, is that whenever there's a weakness in a country, like the breakaway regions here in Donetsk and Luhansk, to circle back to Ukraine, there really is no rules as to what a country can do. Um, countries can really do whatever they want in a situation like that. Like, we can see that uh, in the Vietnam War as the United States and the Soviet Union and China supported, uh, you know, both sides, North Vietnam and South Vietnam, depending on who was more aligned to their interests. You can see that in, uh, in the Koreas. You can also see that in other places around the world, like Syria, you know, where the Russians are actively supporting the Assad regime and we're supporting the Syrian Democratic Forces. So, depending on the situation, it really doesn't matter. Like, countries are really entitled to do whatever they want in breakaway regions or during civil wars. And that's why war seems so long and drawn out. There's a there's a kind of like a joke these days, uh, a meme of sorts, where people will talk about, you know, like time lapse of a normal modern civil war in 30 seconds. And you'll see like 10 factions pop up. And then at the end of the video, it says the war is still going on to this day. And it's been going on for 10 years. And due to how countries can really act inside of these little proxy countries in a way, leaves these wars to go on forever. So I'm sorry if I went off on an aside there, but I hope that um, answers your question to a pretty good bit. And I thank you very much for the support. And once again, I hope that answers your question. And so that being said, we're moving on to the next one. Okay, and I just want to quickly say that there was uh, someone who left a comment in the chat just a moment ago. I can't remember their username, but he said he was a veteran and he was complaining about getting timed out um, because I had timed him out for mentioning politics. I just want to say I wasn't trying to disparage your service or anything. And if you're still listening, I, I thank you very much for your service. Uh, as always, to anybody in our military, we very, very much appreciate your service. But as I mentioned earlier, we do like to keep politics out of the chat. So that is the reason why I timed you out. Uh, so no disrespect, but let's try to keep politics out of the chat. Uh, so the next question we have here is from Ben Andrews, who puts in an $18 donation. He says, finally awake when you stream, have a coffee from your Aussie viewers. 
Well, thank you very much. I'm glad to get a call for you from my Aussie viewers. I have a whole bunch of viewers around the world, apparently, like a lot of them that aren't American. And I'm glad to know that this uh, this news has international reach in a way and can get a lot of people watching it. So I thank you very much for the support and the coffee. And with that being said, we're going to move on to the next question. Okay, and next up we have an $18 donation from Andrew Parker who says, Leaf Spring. Leaf Spring. And that being said, on to the next question. And the next question is from Clydesdale1971 with a $10 donation who says, Have a Big Mac on me. It's currently unavailable in Russia. Thank you very much. Honestly, I don't know about y'all, but we had a new restaurant in my area because, you know, Alabama isn't like sophisticated like everyone else. But we got a new fast food restaurant that's a pretty decent ways away from where I am, but it's called Culver's. And it is so good. It's it's better than McDonald's. So if you've never tried it, go to Culver's and try it. I highly recommend it. I'm not being sponsored by him, by the way. I'm just saying it's a good burger. Um, so I thank you very much for the support. I will get a Big Mac, though, because, you know, there's nothing wrong with a Big Mac anyways. And so that being said, we're going to move on to the next question. And the next question of the night is from Eduardo Gonzalez. He puts in a $20 donation. He says, tanks on their own are sitting ducks. Infantry alone are sitting ducks. It takes a combined arms army, tanks, infantry, and air superiority to make it all work. I cannot understand why Russia hasn't employed this strategy yet. Any ideas? I think they're just incompetent, really. I mean, like, it all kind of boils down to that. Because we've seen that over the over a month and a week, nearly, at this point, they haven't developed their tactics at all. They haven't started changing anything they're doing. They're doing the same thing they did at the start. They're just doing it more so now. So I don't think they're actually learning anything at all from what's going on. I don't think they're actually seeing that as a combined arms effort, um, excuse me, to operate their units. I play a game, you know, of course games aren't representative of real life or anything, but I play a game called Warno, and how the Russians are operating their forces inside of Ukraine is a lot how I operate my forces in Warno. I just move them around with almost no support from anything, and they all get killed. So... If they're doing that bad, I mean, they, they haven't learned nothing actually getting back seriously, not speaking about video games or anything, but they have not learned anything. We watch the, almost like the same videos now in terms of how the Russian vehicles are being destroyed that we saw at the very beginning of this war. It's pitiful. I think it's really just down to incompetence, really, to answer the question. So I hope that answers the question very well. And I thank you very much for the support, Edward Gondolins. I think you've been a return supporter here, and it means a lot to me, and I thank you very much for it. And so that being said, we're moving on to the next question. And the next question of the night is from Robert Massey III with a $10 donation. He says, good evening, Enforcer. I was wondering if you had an opinion about why some of the Russians have a V and why some vehicles have a Z. Uh, it depends on what part of the country they started all from. I believe that it is the northern forces kind of in belarus and kind of like the northern area of ukraine that have a z but i'm not entirely sure but it's just kind of dependent on where they started off and it kind of signifies which command they fall under so z's v's and o's because there's a whole bunch of different kinds of markings now but each different marking falls under a different kind of like chain of commands command structure in a way so that's kind of like the difference in between them all i'll maybe I'll maybe try and look into coming up with an identification sheet, and I think a lot of people have already done that online to explain what symbols mean what on these tanks. But I thank you very much for the support, and I hope that answers the question in a way. Um, I try to be as helpful as possible, but I myself haven't really looked into exactly what they mean. I just know that Z's, V's, and O's are Russians for sure. I think the O's are Chechen, but I'm not sure about that like specifically. So I thank you very much for the support, and we're going to move on to the next question. And the next question of the night is from Peter Stevens, who puts in a donation of $14. He says, I heard of news of Russians heading toward the Arctic and causing concerns of Finland and the Western allies. Do you think this is the next area of concern? Oil reserves, question mark. I'm, I don't really think so. Uh, did he say that the Russian fleet was moving towards the Arctic Circle? Uh, yes. I think that's... Uh... I mean, like, you know, that's something that they normally do, you see, because they're based out of Murmansk, I believe, if I'm correct, somewhere in that area. And so it's common for them to just start launching military exercises in the Arctic area. And so it's not really them trying to seize oil fields. And oil fields at sea um, are kind of just a thing you exploit. It's not really anything you have to have people around to, like, defend and such. So 
Uh, to answer that question, I don't really think that's to achieve any aim or other than maybe some kind of military exercise. They do those normally. That's how they lost the Kursk, is that they were doing military exercises near the Arctic Circle in the Barents Sea. So I hope that answers the question to a good bit, um, because that's really all I can add to that. So I thank you very much for the support. Hope that answers the question. And that being said, we're moving on to the next one. And next up is a question from Junebug47 who says, is the compromise Zelensky made to expedite an end to this war go off the table since Putin went against his word? This is heartbreaking and glory to Ukraine. I'm not exactly sure how you're saying that he went against his word because he didn't say anything about stopping attacks. He only, I think he said something about withdrawing forces only. Let me check that, though. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, Russia withdraws troops. Withdrawals from Ukraine. We'll just pull that up. Uh, defense. Uh, let's see if we can get some more specific information here. I know that mainstream, I know I trash mainstream news a lot, but um, this story, they really can't come up with too much because there's a lot of quotes in it for the most part. Uh, it's withdrawing. All the, all the Russians said is that they were withdrawing forces from around Kiev and Chernihiv as a sign of good faith, but they didn't say anything about lessening any kind of attacks on cities in that area. So I don't think they've gone back on their word. Um, I, think, I think they're keeping up to it for the most part. So to answer that question, I don't think they're really going against their word, and I don't think that's actually going to change the negotiation process. Uh, because that wasn't anything that the Russians said they would stop doing as some kind of aerial bombardments or missile attacks. Uh, so to answer that question, I don't think it's actually going to have that much of an effect on the talks. But I thank you very much for the support. And I hope that answers your question a uh, pretty good bit. And so that being said, we're moving on to the next question. And next up, we have a question from Adam the Great, who says, Yeah, man, remember when I asked that two weeks ago, if there had been any evidence of Russians switching sides and fighting for the beautiful people of Ukraine. I asked that, and I was the first one. Lols. Well, I'm glad that you did ask it, and I, we didn't actually have any information way back then to show that that was happening, but now it looks like apparently it is, because I, I think I said way back then, that would be something the Ukrainians would publicize highly if it was happening, because it's a huge propaganda coup to show that the Russians aren't even agreeing with what the Russian government is doing. And so now we can see today that, that those pictures have come out showing that that now is a thing. So I think while a lot of us have been in the mindset, and it was a good, it was a good idea back then, that that was probably going to happen, it hadn't happened yet. And so I'm glad that you're the first one to mention it, because now we can see that that actually did happen. So you, my friend, are predicting the future in a way. And so I thank you very much for the support, and I thank you very much for bringing that up a long time ago, because I think you were the guy I was thinking about when I started saying that today, that that's been a question for weeks um so i thank you very much once again for bringing it up and that being said we're moving on to the next question and the next question is from dc90 that puts in a donation of twenty dollars he says enforcer great coverage have you heard about the swedish swedish air force intercepting two su-25s escorting two su-24s carrying a nuclear loadout that violated their airspace today i did but where I saw it was on a YouTube ch uh, channel that uses the Autobot to talk for them. And whenever I see hear that, it kind of throws up red flags for me that might be a little clickbaity. And so I didn't include it in the news because I was like, is that is that necessarily true? I would really like an official report from the Swedish government to confirm such a thing. Um, also, a, well, wait a minute, no, I, I see where it happened. I'm always looking up here at the northernmost part of Sweden. I'm like, well, they'd have to fly over Finland first. But then again, I forgot they can fly over the Baltic Sea towards the Gotland Stockholm area. So um yeah, that's something that could have happened. Uh but you know, then again I saw it the only place I saw it on today was some text to speech uh YouTube channel and so I always am kind of a little skeptical about what they say because it's like clickbait mania in there. Um but anyways, it may have happened. I'll have to look into it a little bit more. But to answer the question, I did hear about it in passing in a way. And so I thank you very much for the support. I hope that answers the question to a good bit. And we're moving on to the next question. And the next question is from Jason Bourne. He puts in a donation of $10 and says, Russians obviously have no will or motivation to fight the Ukrainians, regardless of Putin's ambitions. 
I think I have to agree with that. That's pretty true as far as we're seeing now. I don't think they have any will to fight the Ukrainians as well. But then again, you know, I kind of have to go on the flip side of that and be a devil's advocate here and think that not all the Russians are goodwilled because if they're all not really into this thing, then wh where are the Russian soldiers that are directly firing into civilian buildings filled with civilians where there are no combatants? Because there must be some soldiers out there that believe in that cause enough that they would kill civilians to support it. So. While I do agree, I, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag kind of thing uh, with a situation like this. There are, of course, Russian soldiers who don't really believe in this. But at the same time, there are other Russian soldiers who believe in this entirely. It's kind of like here in the U.S., you know, some people, and it doesn't matter who's in charge, some people support the government, some people completely do not support the government. And I think it may be the same thing in Russia in a way with some of their people. And so thank you very much for the support. I hope that answers the question in a way. Uh, well, the comment in a way. And so we're going to move on to the next question. And the next question of the night is from Adam the Great. Once again, he puts in another $10 donation and says, in the beginning, we could, ha well, excuse me. In the beginning, we could have gave the Russians the benefit of the doubt. They didn't know they are killing civilians, but now it's a war crime. They should be charged as such when they caught by Ukraine. I do believe so as well. One thing that I don't really know the actual logistics of is how do they figure out who is a war criminal? Um, I know in, I know in World War II it was very easy because you'd have like a guy who was just publicly known as like the butcher of, of like Warsaw or something. And like he had like 10,000 civilian deaths accredited to his direct orders. And so his face was all over the place and you knew exactly who he was. But in a war like this, where the Russians really, as far as we know, aren't glorifying a single commander and what he's doing for us to associate crimes against him. It's like, how are they going to find the people who are accountable for these crimes and then hold them uh, to it after the war's over if they're able to capture these people? I don't really know, but I feel like the Ukrainians will find a way. They've been finding a way to do things that a lot of people have been thinking are, will, are impossible so far. And so I have hope that they will find these people and bring them to justice after this war is over. And so I thank you very much for the support. And that being said, we're moving on to the next question. And the next question is from Adam Lee Fox with a donation of $10. They say, hey, Enforcer, just wanted to say thanks for the fundraiser on Sunday. A family member of mine was the former UNICEF ambassador to Kenya. Thanks again. This is for the Coffee Fund and Slava, Ukraine. Slava Ukraina, and thank you very much. I'm glad that um, we were able to support out UNICEF a pretty good deal. We raised $13,158. I believe it may have gone up a little bit, but that was the last time I checked, we had actually passed the 13,000 mark. So I was very happy about that. And I'm glad to know that we raised $13,000 for UNICEF and cumulatively across all of our fundraisers, we've raised close to $74,000 uh, for causes that are currently operating inside of Ukraine. And so I'm incredibly happy that we've done that much help for the Ukrainians. It means a lot to me and it means a lot to them as well. And I hope that y'all all get, a satisfaction knowing that y'all are doing the right thing and helping out the right cause here. Um, you know, getting a little opinionated in a way, you know, I'm pro Ukrainian. So that's one of the few opinions I take on this channel in a way, but I thank you very much for the support. And I'm glad to know that, uh, one of your family members was, uh, the ambassador to Kenya for UNICEF. Uh, so I bet that meant a lot to y'all personally. And so that being said, we're going to move on to the next question. And the next one is from TJ Johnson. He puts in a donation of $10 and says, for your video game slash drive time Monday fund, have a gallon on me. Oh, thank you very much. I will have a gallon on you. I think they're about that price now per gallon. So yeah, I'll make sure to use it. Thank you very much for the support and uh, helping me to continue to run this channel. And so that being said, we're moving on to the next question. And the next question is from Chris. Uh, Lusak, he puts in a donation of $10 and says, what is the current status of Kirov district, which is the Southwest part of the, of the Donetsk overall, it feels like there's been little war news about the Donbass region compared to Kiev, Mariupol and Kharkiv. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of news that's come out from this area. We know that there is currently a fight in between the Ukrainians and DPR forces and Marinka. But beyond that, it seems like nothing's really happening along the rest of the front lines. I believe that's because the Ukrainians and the DPR and LPR got so dug in in their positions over the past six years, it's really hard to uproot them from it. It's almost a World War I-esque 
state um, in the L DPR and LPR front lines. And so I think that's why we're not hearing a lot of news or progress out of those areas, because it's really hard to push the Ukrainians out of these defensive positions that they've had for so long. Um, so I think that's kind of the reason why we haven't been hearing a lot of news from there. So I hope that answers the question in a way. And I thank you very much for the support. It helps the channel keep going. And so that being said, we're moving on to the next question. And the next question up is from Rich Hogan. He puts in a donation of $10 and says, great materials as always. Thank you very much. I'm glad that we can uh, give some quality information to all of y'all. It means a lot to me to know that a lot of people appreciate it. And once again, it means a lot to me that you're supporting the channel because that helps us to keep going. And uh, so I thank you very much. And so that being said, we're moving on to the next question. Next up is a question from Eric Adams, who puts in a donation of $10. Uh, he says, thanks for keeping politics out of the chat and staying on topic. I appreciate your stream. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I do I do have to say that uh, while I do enjoy that people do get very engaged here, one thing I would like to keep out is politics. I don't really, I don't pick a side. Of course, I have my opinions on politics, but I don't pick a side when it comes to reporting news. The news is the news. And, you know, some people will sit here and say, oh, it's a known fact that party A or party B has the perfectly right I or ideals and no one can argue otherwise. It is just a hardcore fact. The thing is, is that with what political parties argue, especially here in America with the Democrat and Republican parties, like it's morally, like everything they argue on both sides is kind of morally in ambiguous. You could really go either way with anything they're saying and it wouldn't really matter. You know, it's all a matter of opinion as to which one's right or not. And so I keep that stuff out of here because that's not reporting. That's just an opinion piece. And then I start turning into Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, ABC, and a million other news companies that do that kind of stuff. Uh, and I don't want to become that. And so we try and keep politics out of here. And so I thank you so much for appreciating our efforts to make sure that stays out of here. And to the viewers who would like to espouse uh, political beliefs in here, I understand that y'all have a right to say that. Of course you do. But the thing is, is that it, it doesn't really have a place here. This isn't like the right kind of form for it. And so I hope y'all respect that in a way because we're just trying to report news. And when you get into political ideologies, it becomes more of an opinion than news in a way, regardless which side you pick. And so I thank you very much for the support. And we're going to move on to the next question. And Jason Bourne is in the house once again with another $10 donation. He says, I think Russians would do a lot better if they had spaced leaf springs around their armor. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for bringing up that, uh, the leaf springs thing again. A lot of people are getting tired of it, and I understand. You know, it's been going on for a long time. Uh, but, you know, if, if someone wants to make a joke about it, I'm fine with that too. So thank you very much for the little joke. It's pretty neat. And so that being said, we're moving on to the next question. And next up is a uh, question from Freedom First, who puts in a $20 donation once again. They say, howdy, y'all. What do you think uh, if the Ukrainians paint a Z on top of their tanks, hop on a train heading behind enemy lines and create havoc and insurgency. Oh, now that is a, that is, if you're talking about war crimes, that's about one of the spiciest war crimes you can commit right there is impersonating enemy forces, like dressing up to deceive them, to think that you're friendly forces and then killing them uh, or destroying anything. Now that is risky territory right there. Um, according to the Geneva convention, Forces that are caught doing that stuff can be executed on site, and they actually have no protections under the Geneva Convention. So, while it's something they could do, of course, it is a war crime, and so I don't really think that the Ukrainians should be promoted to do something like that, because then they'll start stooping down to the level of the Russians, and then what's really different about either side, you know, Ukraine will be losing everything it stands for in the process, you know, of like freedom, democracy, doing the right thing. Uh, they'll become pretty much the Russians in a way and just start doing whatever to try and win, even if it's underhanded and against the rules of war. And so I see where you're coming from, but unfortunately it is a war crime. But I thank you very much for the support and the question. It is a interesting one to delve into, and it's something that a lot of militaries have done before and wars prior, and so it's not something unheard of. Um, so I thank you very much for the support, and so that being said, we're moving on to the next question. And next up we have a question from... Uh, who is becoming a longtime channel supporter, Anthony K. Smith. Uh, he puts in a donation of $8 and says, Hello, Enforcer. Those uh, Chechnyan are TikTok soldiers only, according to the Ukrainian soldiers. Also, my friend in Kurzon says the Russians are not in the city yet, but the airport has been hit 10 times. Interesting. 
Uh, I'm, I'll be looking out for a lot of news on the area around Kursan because we haven't been getting any, and I really hate that because it's an area that's kind of like a linchpin of the entire southern operation for Russians. So it's like, what is the fate of Kursan? We just haven't heard anything yet. And so I'll keep an eye out for more news on that. And also, I thank you very much for the rest of the info you shared with us tonight. I'll make sure to keep note of that as well. And so I thank you very much for the support. And that being said, how many Super Chats do we have left, Matthew? Well, it looks like we have about uh, 10 of them left. All right. Uh, and that being said, on to the next question. And the next one is from Carlos Brasino. He says, Crimea's only water supply used to come out of southern Ukraine. Ukrainians cut off the supply after the annexation. This is why Putin wants so badly to take over the south. Gas was found there. Interesting. I didn't know about the water supply situation, but I didn't know that there had been any gas deposits found inside of southern Ukraine. So that may be a reason why Russia is trying to eyeball it. I believe another reason is that kind of like, well, nah, I mean, like even Germany's uh, little, you know, f um, little endeavor into Lebensraum in the 40s kind of involved more economic concerns that more so than kind of like ethnic concerns in a way if you really look at what um the guy the chancellor of germany was advocating at the time it had it had a decent bit to do with ethnic uh ethnicity but it had more so to do with germany's economic standing in the future so it was really an economic uh decision more so than like a straight up ethnic decision although we saw in the end that's really all it turned into um but i thank you very much for the support and that's interesting information i did not know that they had found gas deposits in southern Ukraine, but I didn't know about the water situation in Crimea. So I thank you very much once again. And that being said, we're moving on to the next question. Okay, and the next question is from Clydesdale1971, putting in a $10 donation again. Um, they say, if you're going to Culver's, here's another 10 bucks to get the cheese curds. Thank you for your dedication to giving us a full day supply of Ukrainian events. Oh man, I got to tell you, the cheese curds are delicious, man. I've had them before. I've only had them once because, like, I ate them, and I felt like my, my arteries were already clogging uh, with cholesterol and all. But, man, were they good. It was worth the two years that it took off my life. Those things were delicious. I'll make sure to get some more since you sent me uh, some funds to go get some cheese curds. So I thank you very much for the support. And I'm glad that you agree with me that Culver's makes some delicious food. I have to say, I'm a big fan of them. And so, that being said, thank you once again, and we're going to move on to the next question. And I'll take some of those cheese curds, too, while you're at it. But anyways, the next question is from Stuart X 13 He says, don't forget about the IT guys on ATV and the 40-mile-long convoy. I did see that, and I looked into it, um, but that's something that I'm waiting for a lot more information to come out on. Uh, because as far as I knew, the 40-mile convoy really didn't get hit by the Ukrainians at all. It kind of just fell apart just due to in, the Russian issues that they were having internally within their supply chains and stuff. But I did look at it, and I'm still putting it under consideration, but I'm not wanting to say, um, I'm not wanting to change the story too much right now in light of um, kind of like a lack of information, in my opinion. But we're still looking into it. So I thank you very much for the support. And we are thinking about that, and I am considering it. And so I thank you once again, and we're going to move on to the next question. And the next question is from uh, Christian Doming, uh, who says, they got their main goals, and it's going to look like they are pulling out Chernobyl, oil industry zones, plus wells, and above all, the coast for porch control. That is true, but the thing to me is that uh, if they've achieved their goals, why wouldn't they keep their forces at the same strength until a peace settlement could be agreed upon where they actually keep that territory? Because withdrawing forces before a peace agreement can be agreed upon just allows the Ukrainians the chance to actually overpower the Russian forces that are left and then push them back and make them lose the territory that they uh, claim they have actually achieved as their goal. So I know where you're coming from with that, but I'm not entirely sure if that is 100% the case. I think they're actually just withdrawing the forces because of the logistical issues. But then again, I could be wrong, and we'll wait in the coming days to see if um, that is true or not. So I thank you very much for the support, and I thank you very much for the comment. It's an interesting comment to delve into, and maybe some people could get into a discussion about that in the chat, so that way we can see if a lot of people agree uh, with that or, or, or with me. So uh, very interesting input. Uh, thank you very much for the support once again, and we're going to move on to the next question. 
And real quickly, I want to recognize two donations without comments. We have one from Beth Vanderloop for $5, and we also have one from yours truly for $5 as well. Thank you both for your support of the channel. We appreciate it very much, like always. The next question up for the night is from Diffuse56 with a $5 donation. They say, I heard that the Russian army does not have NCOs. Is this one of the reasons they're in such a mess? Sergeants are the backbone of our army. That is true. The United States has an incredibly strong NCO core. Russia uh, has almost no NCO core. I mean, like that's that's something that's kind of like a shortcoming of the Russians. Kind of like one of those weird things that we that we look at over here. Kind of like them having a railroad, like railroad to logistics divisions, like ten of them or so. And we're like, wow, that's like some funky stuff. That's like the weirdest thing. And they have like no NCOs, and the officers fill in the roles of the NCOs as they would here in the U.S. And the joke over here in the United States, like you you can hear this from veterans from World War II to Afghanistan, all, you know, officers have no clue how anything's done, actually, you know, like, especially first and second lieutenants, they just don't have a clue at all. And so imagine those people, first and second lieutenants, not a clue in their head how anything works. And they're putting the role of sergeants, squad leaders, um, fire team leader, all that stuff. I mean, like, they're in control of all that stuff, and they have no clue how anything actually works, and they have no experience. And so I bet that's leading them to have a lot of problems like they are right now and leading things to be um, terrible in the end. So yes, I do agree that may be one of the reasons that things are going so poorly for them is that they really have a lack of experienced field commanders or, you know, NCO roles for that matter. So I thank you very much for the support, and I do have to agree with you that probably is a severe hindrance of the Russians and uh, the NCO Corps is a major part of the U.S. military and most Western militaries, and it always has been for us. So I thank you very much for the support, and we're going to move on to the next question. And the next question is from Daniel Nusk. Um, puts in a donation of $5 and says, I just wanted to point out that one of the videos you played yesterday was generated using GPT-3 which is an algorithm that, given 10 keywords, will generate a reasonable text. That sounds weird on a video, though. Interesting. Uh, I don't know the exact video you're talking about, but I will try and rake my brain here over the next few minutes and see if I can think about which one it was. But I do thank you for the support, and I thank you for bringing that up. That's some interesting info to delve on. So thank you once again, and we're going to move on to the next question. And the next question is from Mike Spike, who says, please talk about a Chernobyl, uh, Google Russian troops getting sick from disturbing the soil and driving by while digging, radiation levels rising from dust, total disregard. Yeah, I do have to agree. They've been having a total disregard for the Chernobyl area. Well, really all nuclear areas that they've ever come up on for a while now. And I have heard some uh, off reports you know, like a few here and there is what I mean by all reports of Russians getting sick in the area. And it also appears that they're holding the work crews that work at the Chernobyl plant hostage and they're keeping them there. Um, so that's some interesting stuff to consider. It's not really something that is like major news per se, in my opinion, because a couple of Russian soldiers getting sick from radiation poisoning. Yeah, you know, you kind of expect that tourists get sick from radiation poisoning in Chernobyl. So uh, that's something to consider, but I uh, thank you very much uh, for the observation and the info. It is something always important to note, and so for everyone who may not know, because I haven't been covering it a lot on here, there are soldiers that are getting sick from radiation poisoning, and the movement of Russian vehicles through the Chernobyl exclusion zone is kicking up a little bit of radioactive dust, and it is, of course, leading to health effects on the soldiers that are, you know, passing through. So I thank you very much for the support, and we're going to move on to the next question. And the next question is from George, New York's premier contractor. I haven't seen George in quite a while. It's good to see you again, George. Uh, he says, apparently Chinese 999 walkie-talkies got most of the orc generals killed in 21st century, only in Russia. Only in Russia, I have to agree. The Russians love Chinese stuff these days, as we saw. They had dry rot on the cheap Chinese tires they bought for most of their wheeled vehicles. And so I have to say... It doesn't look like buying Chinese is a good idea in the long run for anything in terms of military operations. And I would say I think the Russians are learning from that. But as we can see through how they've been fighting this war for the past month and a week, it appears that they learned nothing. So I'm sure that they won't actually change that, which will be a good thing for us here in the West, but it won't be a good thing for them. 
So I thank you very much for the support, and I'm glad to see you back. I know that you've been active in the chat a little bit. I've seen you here and there, but it's good to know that you're supporting the channel again, and we, of course, appreciate all the support that anyone can give because it, it helps us run, and I cannot emphasize that enough. That's the only way this channel runs is off of support through Super Chats. We've completely turned off ads on the video, so we, we get no AdSense. And we also run no sponsorship. So this is literally the only way the channel runs. And so I thank you all so much for supporting it. It means a lot to me. And so that being said, we're going to move on to the next question. And we have an $8 donation from Peter Stevens, who says, Despite Russia's attack on Ukraine, why is its generals not man enough to tell Putin the truth of the war? This is what America is staying in its under overing. I'm not sure what he meant to say there. I think that Putin actually does know the, the actual situation. I think that's something that the U.S. government or the mainstream news is trying to push in a way that Putin doesn't know what's going on. But here's my thing. If he didn't know what was going on in the war or to his own people, why did he come out and give that speech talking about the fifth column, all of the traitors inside of the country, and that things were going to get bad economically and there were going to be shortages? If he was completely out of the loop, that speech wouldn't make any sense because it, said, it showed that he had complete knowledge of what was going on inside of Ukraine and Russia. And so I think that's him. I think that's the West trying to start to spin a story. So that way, maybe they can help him find a way out. You know, so when this war ends terribly, he can sit there and go, I didn't have an idea. Even the Western government saw that. And it's the, the, the fault of these generals. Maybe that's something that they're doing. I can't really tell, though. This is too early into this kind of like spin on the story to see where this will lead. But I do believe that Putin is entirely aware of everything that's going on. Because uh, we could see that in the speech that he get, gave about the fifth column. He like clearly stated, word for word, the actual state of the Russian economy, the collapse of the ruble, shortages, and so on. So I thank you very much for the support, and I hope that answers the question in a way. And so that being said, we're moving on to the next question. And the next question of the night is from Dino Ress, who says, Enforcer, search POMZ on YouTube to see operation of the POM2 anti-personnel mine cousin to the POM3 you mentioned earlier. Let's take a look at that. Um, he said POMZ? Uh, yes, POMZ. Got you. POMZ. Let's see what we get with that. Okay, we got a POM2. Let's see what this looks like. Interesting. Okay, so it appears that it has a little explosive head that it blows off the top of the mine. But that's kind of a goofy, I mean, like, you know, I don't know how it's actually used. It looks like they're showing how it's used here. But that's kind of goofy for the entire mine to be exposed above ground where you can clearly see it. Like, what? <laughs> Who in the world will walk up on that thing? You can see it. Like, the, I thought the whole point of a mine was for it to be hidden in a way. So that way soldiers would, un like, unknowingly walk up onto it and then, you know, activate the mine. But this thing is above ground right here. It's, like, clearly visible. So, I mean, like, of course it probably works because they've, they've filled a decent amount of these things and they're being used. I just don't really know how they actually are used when they're actually there. I, I'm kind of confused about that. But I thank you very much for bringing that up so that way we could see how it works. And so now all of us have a pretty good idea of how it functions. And so thank you very much for bringing that up. And that being said, we're moving on to the next question. Okay, and just real quickly, I want to recognize... A donation from Martin Nielsen. Thank you very much for your support of the channel. Um, next up, we have another question from Adam the Great, who puts in a donation of $10 and says, screw that. They should just find out uh, where the shells come from. And if those Russian soldiers get caught, they're automatically, no matter what, charged with a war crime. Interesting. Uh, that's an interesting input on that. Uh, 
that would be of course kind of a tough thing to do is they they wouldn't have undeniable proof showing that those soldiers were the ones who committed the crime and so they could just start executing soldiers that didn't really have anything to do with it and that could start leading the russians to executing ukrainian prisoners that had nothing to do with anything and they could just start claiming that these guys were uh, you know, active in war crimes. You always got to be careful with what you do with prisoners because anything you're doing to the other side's prisoners is something they could do to yours. So if you start executing Russian prisoners without any hardcore evidence to show that they did in fact commit a war crime, they could start doing the same thing to your prisoners. And so it's kind of like a looking out for their prisoners and in turn they'll look out for yours kind of situation. And so um, that's kind of how I'm looking at it. But thank you very much for the input. It is an interesting perspective. And so that being said, we're going to move on to the next question. And the next one is from Joseph Fulton. He says, do you think enough real news has made it to the Russian people to disrupt the upcoming April 1st conscription significantly? Man, that's a tough one because I don't think there has been. The Russians have a pretty tight grasp on what they put on TV. And so the Russians only see what the Russians the Russian government wants them to see. And so I don't think enough true information has made it through to the Russians for them to know what's really going on. And I think that most of the protesters that were active in Russia in prior weeks have either been arrested or given up at this point or fled the country. So I'm not really sure how the information situation is unfolding inside of Russia, but I don't think it's in the advantage of letting them actually know what's going on inside of Ukraine. And so I thank you very much for the support. And I think that's kind of my stance on this for now. It may change, though, if information comes out to show otherwise. But I thank you once again, and we're going to move on to the next question. And the next one is from Lucid Insanity, who says, The newly developed Palm 3 landmines banned under international treaties were discovered in Kharkiv. Yes, we did actually show that a little bit earlier in the stream. If you'd like to go check out the... Uh, little marker yourself it's right here and we have a link in the description below to this exact map that i'm using on stream right now so make sure to go take a look at it if you like to see um the pictures i found of that today and so that being said we're moving on to the next question and the next one is from chris boyer he says white phosphorus is not a war crime i'm a desert storm marine and we used it on iraqi troops uh well i mean Maybe y'all did, but as far as I know, using white phosphorus, because I actually talked to a veteran a while ago about uh, the usage of white phosphorus inside of Syria and Afghanistan, and he said it was a war crime. So let me check that real quick and just make sure. White phosphorus, war crime. Let's see what we got here. Uh, is white phosphorus illegal in war? Because, I mean, like, there is there is stipulations that I said before to the use of white phosphorus. For example, if you can prove that the soldiers that were being attacked with this white phosphorus explosive were killed in the explosion, I believe that's a fine use of white phosphorus according to the Geneva Convention. But if they were killed in the subsequent burning of the phosphorus, then that is a war crime. And, I'll, and of course, it's always a war crime to kill civilians regardless of what kind of weapon is being used. Uh... Let's see, later uses, World War One. Let's see here. Let's just look at the, the table of contents. Um, effects, international law. There we go. While well, general white phosphorus, uh, not subject to certain uses in weaponry or banned. Uh, Article 1 defines an incendiary weapon as any weapon or munition which is primarily designed to set fire to objects or to cause burn injury to persons through the action of flame, heat, or combination thereof produced by a chemical reaction. Uh, Article 2 of the same protocols prohibits the deliberate use of incendiary weapons against civilian targets, uh, the use of air-delivered incendiary weapons against military targets in civilian areas, and the general use of other types of incendiary weapons against military targets located within concentrations of civilians without taking all possible means to minimize casualties. So what that's saying right there is that the way the Russians are using it, because the picture that we have of the white phosphorus is... Let me let me go back to it real quick to just show it again. This is being used over a population center. And so, according to the articles in the Geneva Convention, that is a war crime. It may have been different in Iraq during the Gulf War. Of course, you know, obviously, because the Iraqis were set up in positions, as far as I know, and of course you were there, so you may know better, 
but they were mostly set up in positions that were completely separated from civilian centers. And so y'all could actually use white phosphorus on them without really any regard as to how much you were using or where, because there was no civilians around. And so y'all didn't have to be concerned about white phosphorus raining down on civilians or a population center and just burning a whole bunch of civilians. If not, according to what we're seeing on Wikipedia, you know how much Wikipedia can be trusted is kind of a questionable thing. But we can see here that it says that using it around population center, uh, centers or civilian targets is prohibited under the Geneva Convention. So I thank you very much for the comment, uh, but that's what I know right now. It appears to be fine to use on combatants, but it cannot be used under any conditions where there's a possibility that civilians could be injured or killed by it. So I thank you very much for the support. And with that being said, we're going to move on to the next question. And Jason Bourne steps back into the super chats. I uh, would this on, time the one second. Off, My headset just died on me. So give me just a second to rehook this up. Stand by. Give me just a second. Speak now. Can you hear me? One second. Hey, Hang on. Let me try something else. Sorry about this, y'all. All right. Speak now. Enforcer, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Hopefully there's not any reverb. Uh, let me check that real quick and throw up the card. Uh, talk real quick. Enforcer, can you hear me? Ah, oh, man, that's being picked up on the uh, microphone. So, uh, uh, let me let me throw that back up to the screen. Hopefully, everyone can bear with that a little bit. I'm sorry about the headset dying. Let me see if I can actually get that set up again. Everyone, hang with me for just a second. Stand by, Matthew. Okay, so I think... Try talking real quick. Enforcer, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. So on to the questions. Let me throw back up the normal screen. All right. And so the next question. Okay. So the next question is from Jason Bourne. He's back in the super chat again. Uh, he says, I don't think the Russian artillery units really know what they're aiming at. They were just given coordinates and, the, and told to fire there. Yes, I can agree with that. But the thing is, is that in the end, uh, someone must be held accountable for war crimes. And so if it was an artillery crew that got the orders to fire at that building and they carried out that order, someone will have to be held accountable in that artillery unit, whether it be the commander or the um, fire control team that gave them the coordinates to fire at those buildings. It'll have to be, someone will be held accountable for war crimes in the end, but I do agree with your statement there. And so with that being said, we're going to move on to the next question. Next up is one from That Frost Wolf, who says, "If Russia was ever, uh, if Russia was to ever desire to invade Israel in the future, how do you think that might be possible, or how they would do that?" I don't really think that would be necessarily possible, considering that uh, they would first have to try and win the civil war in Syria to have a friendly government in the Middle East to their interests. But then again, you know, most of the Middle Eastern countries that are not Israel hate Israel with a burning passion. And so I'm sure that they would be kind of like the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And maybe the Russians could start basing um, forces anywhere around Israel, like Jordan or Egypt. But I'm not entirely sure about that. So um, I don't want to say anything there for sure. And that's kind of really, to be honest, a little beyond the scope of my stream right now. I'd have to look into a bit of research to see if there is a possible way for them to do this. So I'm kind of speaking from a position of assumptions and ignorance in a way here. So um, unfortunately, that's really all I can give as an answer without delving too far into way too many assumptions for me to be happy with. So I hope I answered that question to the best of my abilities. And I hope that the answer kind of covered what you were looking for in a way. Unfortunately, I can't go into it too much. But I thank you very much for the support. And with that being said, how many Super Chats do we have, Matthew? And after you answer that, let's get on to the next question. So it looks like we have eight left. Uh, the next one is from Vardman Jane, who says, thanks for all the fundraising. Ukrainian nonprofit for the next fundraiser, please. Um, no, NOV Ukraine. Or gotcha. NOV Ukraine, excuse me. Oh, gotcha. Um, I do understand what you're, uh, what you're saying. You're wanting a Ukrainian fundraiser. But the thing is, is that 
all of our fundraisers have to go through the guidestar.org website and it has to have a verified EIN number. I'm not really sure if there are any Ukrainian organizations in the GuideStar program. I haven't been able to find them yet. But if there are, we will try and consider one and make sure to make it the next fundraiser. So I thank you very much for the suggestion and the support as well. And that being said, we're going to move on to the next question. And next up, we have another one from Dino Ress, who says the palm mines are airdropped and stick in the ground with seismic needles that get embedded into the ground. All right, that's interesting. I did not know that. I thought um, for a good bit that these little mines were just dropped off on the ground like a normal mine, you know, like a normal anti-personnel or an anti-tank mine, although obviously that one's an anti-personnel mine. And they just kind of were dug inside of the ground. I didn't know that they were dropped by the air. But then... I don't know. I mean, like, no, I'm not, I'm not I'm going to delve into that. I'm kind of ignorant about how uh, that mine would actually be used, so I'm not going to ask that question. It may be ignorant. So I thank you very much for the comment and the information. And so that being said, we're going to move on to the next question. And next up, we have another one from Adam the Great. It says, press that like button. I'm on top of a ladder paying a house right now, and I know how to press the like button. It's not that difficult. <laughs> well, I thank you very much for the support. And if everyone does like this stream, Make sure to click the like button because it does help us out a lot. Uh, so far, we usually get around 3,000 likes a night, but if we could bump that up to like four or 5,000 likes, uh, this, of course, would reach a lot more people because YouTube would be saying, wow, a lot of people like this. And so if you do like it, uh, make sure to help out this channel in reaching more people by liking the stream as well. And so I thank you very much for the support. Once again, Adam the Great and being a return supporter of the channel and also support uh, like encouraging people to like uh, the video. And so I thank you once again. And so that being said, we're gonna move on to the next question. And we just got a $5 donation in from Furry who says, greetings, love your channel. Thanks for the hard work. Well, I thank you very much for the support, and I'm glad that you enjoy the channel. I hope you'll be here for days or weeks to come. This does come on every night at 10 p.m. Eastern Time, except for Monday now. I think Monday will become a permanent day off on this channel to allow me to kind of like take a break for a minute and make sure that I don't start getting worn out again like I did through the first whole month of streaming. So I thank you very much for the support. And with that being said, we're going to move on to the questions uh, that from the chat that we have or the super chats if we have any left. Okay, and we have uh, about seven super chats left. We have one that just came in from Freedom First again for $5. He says, just asking, can we try to have the Speak the Truth guy on YouTube as a guest speaker? Uh, yes, we can. We can try and have him on, but I'm not really sure if that would work. And I'd also like to run a poll real quick uh, before we ever did anything like that again with the audience just to make sure that everyone would be happy with a guest speaker being brought on at all anymore considering that the first one went so disastrously. So I thank you very much for the support and we're going to move on to the next question. And real quickly, I just want to recognize a $5 donation from Paul and a $5 uh, donation from Dark Positive. Thank you both for your support of the channel. And moving on to the next question. We have here from Mark Bohai Chuck. Once again, he says, sorry, you got to cut out early tonight. Here's the coffee money. Cheers. And he puts in a donation of $5. Well, I thank you very much for the support. And I thank you for supporting the coffee fund. Uh, I'm definitely going to make sure to keep on drinking coffee because that's like the best way I can get through these streams reasonably. <laughs> and so I thank you very much uh, for continuing to help out the coffee fund. And so we're going to move on to the next question. And thank you once again for the support. Okay, and we have a question here from Anthony K. Smith. He says, um, by the way, the PRC has never stepped foot in Taiwan. Taiwan has only been a province for 10 years until taken by the Japanese. Uh, yes, I do agree with that. That is true. And uh, so I thank you very much for sharing the info. And so that being said, we're going to move on to the next question. Okay, and the next one is from Lee G, who says, do you think uh, May 9th will be the end of the war, VE Day? I don't, I don't think the Russians are going to go for any kind of symbolic end of the war here. I think they're really honestly wanting this war to end as soon as possible now because it's just getting worse and worse for them and nothing is getting better. Um, but then again, I might be wrong. Maybe they'll just stretch this thing out to May 9th just to do it. Um, but I'm not entirely sure about that. Usually uh, military decisions don't revolve around symbolic things unless the victory is assured. And then the symbolic stuff can be considered. But right now, 
they were getting it handed to him. So I don't think they're like eyeballing a specific date for this to happen. And also it would be terrible that if they had to get some kind of peace agreement, they would end up with kind of like a, a draw or a defeat on their side. And then it would end on victory day, which would leave a bitter taste in everyone's mouths. So I'm not entirely sure about that, but I thank you very much for the support. And we're going to move on to the next question. And the next one is from Diogo Jose Teixeira da Silva who says those Russian POWs could be saboteurs in Forcer. Uh, they could be, but considering that they've made it that far with the Ukrainians, I'm sure they've been vetted and they've figured out that they're not saboteurs or something like that. But then again, you know, we can never be sure, and I'm sure they're going to keep a very close eye on them if they ever do make it back to the front. So I thank you very much for the support and bringing that up. It is a decent uh, suggestion and something they should make sure to look into. And so that being said, we're moving on to the next question. And the next one is from Kevin Scott, 76. He says, sounds like you're from Huntsville, Alabama, like me. No, um, I, I really don't want to give out my exact location a lot, but I am from Alabama. It's just not from Huntsville. It's, it's south, but everything's south of Huntsville. So, you know, it could be anywhere from like Mobile to Warrior. Who knows? But anyways, I thank you very much for the support. And with that being said, we're going to move on to the next question. And the last uh, Super Chat of the night is from Vardman Jane who says, I confirmed Nova Ukraine on GuideStar. They are based in California, but run by Ukrainians. Uh, started in 2014, and they give their GuideStar ID here, which I will save as a note. Got you, and we'll make sure to look into that, um, into that fundraiser, and we might actually use that one during the next fundraiser. So I thank you very much for that comment. And so we're now going to move on to the questions from the live chat. Okay, and just real quickly, uh, Chris uh, Lusak put in another $10 donation and said, kindly asking you to say we're moving on to the next upcoming question. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to move on to the next upcoming question. Uh, so thank you for the donation. And the next question we have is from the regular chat. And let me get there real quick. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ryan 9000, he asked, Enforcer, do you think the recent negotiations between Russia and Ukraine should be taken seriously? I do think they should because it appears that something is coming out of it because we've seen Zelensky give a little and then we've seen uh, the Russians give a little as well with their withdrawal of forces around uh, the northern front. But then again, I don't really think that was actually a diplomatic gesture. I think that's a strategic gesture to try and lighten the load on their logistics up there. Um, but then again, it does look like this talk, these talks are making more ground than prior ones. So I do think they should be taken seriously to some degree, but... Once again, you know, talk should be taken with a grain of salt. They could fall apart at any moment. So that's kind of my stance on it right now. It looks like it's making progress, but I wouldn't hold your breath on it because it could fall apart any day. So I thank you very much for the support. I hope that answers your question. And so we're going to move on to the next one. And the next one is from James Reyes. He says, Enforcer, if the war ended today, would the history books write about how Ukrainian uh, fought a larger country and won? Or would it focus... Uh, more on how Russia's military was incompetent. What are your thoughts? I think it would focus on both. And we have a perfect war to show an example of that, which is the Winter War in Ukraine. I, I'm sorry, not the Winter War in Ukraine, the Winter War in Finland. I'm getting kind of a little tired right now, so I'm getting mixed up in what I'm saying. But uh, the Winter War in Finland, whenever you read about it in the history books, it emphasizes how Finland fought the Soviet Union and won, in a way, and it also emphasizes the incompetence of the Russians at the same time. So I think if the Ukrainians are to win this war, history will remember that a smaller country beat the Russians and the Russians appear to be completely incompetent the entire time. So I think that's kind of how it's going to go down in history uh, when it's written. But I thank you very much for um, the question. It was a great question. We actually saw that one at the beginning of the stream. And I told Matthew to take a note of that one immediately because I wanted to answer it. I thought it was a great question. And hopefully a lot of people can maybe talk about that in the chat because I just think it was that good. And so we're now going to move on to the next question. And the next question is from Kate Thomas, who says, Enforcer, any news on possibly getting some of those chop, chop excuse me, not choppers, choppers we got in Germany to the Ukrainians? I don't really know about getting uh, helicopters to the Ukrainians. The thing is, is that U.S. helicopters are very different uh, from Soviet, post-Soviet helicopters that the Ukrainians are using. And so I'm sure that their helicopter crews would have to be trained 
on how to use them, which would take time and effort. And I don't think the Ukrainians are wanting to dedicate that time and effort into it right now, considering the current situation. And that would also take a decent amount of helicopter pilots out of the fight. I think they're really more so looking for Mi-24s and former Soviet helicopters to operate inside of Ukraine because that's what their helicopter pilots have been trained on at the moment. And so it's the easiest thing to go to. So I thank you very much for the question. And so um, that being said, we'll go to one more question from the chat and then that will be the end of the stream for the night. And so what is the last question? And the last question is from Khalil Jardim, who says, Enforcer, any thoughts about the moral side of playing War Thunder? which is a Russian game in this time of war. Actually, it's not a Russian game. It has offices in Russia, but their headquarters is actually in Budapest, Hungary. I had looked into that at the beginning of this war because I was like, I don't want to play a game that is being operated by a Russian company. That's why I stopped playing Escape from Tarkov because it's a Russian company completely, and so I don't play that game anymore. But War Thunder is actually Hungarian, which was really interesting to me because for years I heard it was a Russian game. Because everyone's always talking about, oh, the Russians, you know, they make the best realistic games, you know, that are fun. And so it's actually Hungarian, which is just like mind blowing to me because that's not what I've heard before. But if you pull it up, their headquarters is in Budapest, Hungary. So it's not a Russian game. So there's really nothing that you have to weigh in morally with that. They have offices in Russia, but I think they also have offices in the United States. So it's just kind of a business thing in terms of where the offices are. But with that being said, that was the last question of the night. Uh, I would like to uh, thank our supporters who sent in Super Chats after the cutoff in a way. I know there wasn't an official... Well, actually, since there wasn't an official cutoff tonight, could we read off the last two or three Super Chats we've had? I saw them kind of come through. I'd just like to answer them really quickly or at least give them um, a thank you for supporting us. And so what do we got, hey. Matthew? So we have a $5 donation here from Jason Bourne. And I believe that's the only one here uh, that came in late. And also, real quickly, I just want to ask one last um, regular chat question. Just because uh, this viewer has been around the entire stream, his name is Robert Durham, and he asked the question, Enforcer, do you think that Russians will overtly or covertly ask for their tanks back as part of the peace deal? Or perhaps Ukraine will have a captured tank parade. I think that the Russians won't be able to ask for those tanks back. Uh, it would be something a little bit too embarrassing because at that point they would be admitting they lost a load of them. And then the Ukrainians would be able to make the number public as to how many tanks they captured. And it would just look bad for the Russians, you know, considering that they would be making the picture look like they're so strapped for tanks that they have to beg for them back from the enemy that pretty much captured them completely intact. So I think, if anything, the Ukrainians will probably parade these tanks on their uh, social media platforms and on, you know, Ukrainian TV and stuff for a good while because it's actually a huge success that they've captured so many vehicles intact during this war. And so that's kind of my standpoint on this. And so I thank you all, all very much for the questions and the support tonight. I hope you all have gotten a lot out of the news, uh, as, of course, I've always had a good time making sure to report this news to you all and let you all get the most up-to-date news that I can possibly provide. This stream does, of course, come on every single day of the week at 10 p.m. Eastern Time, except for Monday. Uh, Mondays will now be the official day off for me every week, so that way I can make sure to keep... Uh, alive during this whole entire thing make sure i have enough energy to sound alive and so i thank y'all all so much for the support i'm glad that y'all all enjoy the stream and i hope y'all have an incredible night and i'll see y'all all tomorrow at 10 p.m eastern time thank you once again and i'll see y'all around